Dracula by Bram Stoker Chapter 23 Dr. Seward's Diary 3 October The time seemed terribly long whilst we were waiting for the coming of Godalming and Quincy Morris. The professor tried to keep our minds active by using them all the time. I could see his beneficent purpose by the side glances which he threw from time to time at Harker. The poor fellow is overwhelmed in a misery that is appalling to see. Last night he was a frank, happy-looking man with strong, youthful face, full of energy and with dark brown hair. Today he is a drawn, haggard old man whose white hair matches well with the hollow, burning eyes and grief-written lines of his face. His energy is still intact. In fact, he is like a living flame. This may yet be his salvation, for if all go well it will tide him over the despairing period. He will then, in a kind of way, wake again to the realities of life. Poor fellow! I thought my own trouble was bad enough, but his! The professor knows this well enough, and is doing his best to keep his mind active. What he has been saying was, under the circumstances, of absorbing interest. So well as I can remember, here it is. I have studied over and over again, since they came into my hands, all the papers relating to this monster, and the more I have studied... "'the greater seems the necessity to utterly stamp him out. "'All through there are signs of his advance, "'not only of his power, but of his knowledge of it. "'As I learned from the researches of my friend Arminius of Budapest, "'he was in life a most wonderful man, soldier, statesman, and alchemist, "'which latter was the highest development of the science knowledge of his time. "'He had a mighty brain, a learning beyond compare, and a heart that knew no fear and no remorse. He dared even to attend the Sholomans, and there was no branch of knowledge of his time that he did not essay. Well in him the brain power survived the physical death, though it would seem that memory was not all complete. In some faculties of mind he has been and is only a child. But he is growing, and some things that were childish at the first are now of man's stature. He is experimenting and doing it well, and if it had not been that we had crossed his path, he would be yet, he may be yet if we fail, the father or furtherer of a new order of beings whose road must lead through death, not life. Harker groaned and said, And this is all arrayed against my darling. But how is he experimenting? The knowledge may help us to defeat him. He has all along, since his coming, been trying his power, slowly but surely. That big child brain of his is working. Well, for us, it is as yet a child brain, for had he dared at the first to attempt certain things, he would long ago have been beyond our power. However, he means to succeed, and the man who has centuries before him can afford to wait and to go slow. Pastini Lenti may well be his motto. I fail to understand, said Harker wearily. Oh, do be more plain to me. Perhaps grief and trouble are dulling my brain. The professor laid his hand tenderly on his shoulder as he spoke. Ah, ha, my child, I will be plain. Do you not see how, of late, this monster has been creeping into knowledge experimentally? How he has been making use of the zoophagus patient to effect his entry into friend John's home? For your vampire though in all afterwards he can come when and how he will, must at the first make entry only when asked thereto by an inmate. But these are not his most important experiments. Do we not see how, at the first, all these so great boxes were moved by others? He knew not then, but that must be so. But all the time that so great child brain of his was growing, and he began to consider whether he might not himself move the box. So, he began to help, and then, when he found that this be all right, he tried to move them all alone, and so he progressed, and he scattered these graves of him, and none but he know where they are hidden. He may have intend to bury them deep in the ground, so that only he use them in the night, or at such time as he can change his form, they do him equal well, and none may know these are his hiding place. But my child, do not despair. This knowledge came to him just too late. Already all of his layers but one be sterilized as for him, and before the sunset this shall be so. Then he have no place where he can move and hide. I delayed this morning so that we might be sure. Is there not more at stake for us than for him? 
then why not be more careful than him? By my clock, it is one hour, and already, if all be well, friend Arthur and Quincy are on their way to us. Today is our day, and we must go sure, if slow, and lose no chance. See, there are five of us when those absent ones return. Whilst we were speaking, we were startled by a knock at the hall door. The double postman's knock of the telegraph boy. We all moved out to the hall with one impulse, and then Helsing, holding up his hands to us to keep silence, stepped to the door and opened it. The boy handed in a dispatch. The professor closed the door, and after looking at the direction, opened it and read aloud. Look out for D. He has just now, 12.45, come from Carfax hurriedly and hastened towards the south. He seems to be going the round and may want to see you. Mina. There was a pause broken by Jonathan Harker's voice. Now God be thanked. We shall soon meet. Van Helsing turned to him quickly and said, God will act in his own way and time. Do not fear and do not rejoice as yet, for what we wish at the moment may be our undoings. I care for nothing now, he answered hotly, except to wipe out this brute from the face of creation. I would sell my soul to do it. Oh, hush, hush, my child, said Van Helsing. God does not purchase souls in this wise, and the devil, though he may purchase, does not keep faith. But God is merciful and just, and knows your pain and your devotion to that dear Madame Mina. Think you how her pain would be doubled did she but hear your wild words. Do not fear any of us. We are all devoted to this cause, and today shall see the end. The time is coming for action. Today this vampire is limbent to the powers of man, and till sunset he may not change. It will take him time to arrive here. See, it is twenty minutes past one, and there are yet some times before he can hither come, be he ever so quick. What we must hope for is that my Lord Arthur and Quincy arrive first. About half an hour after we had received Mrs. Harker's telegram, there came a quiet, resolute knock at the hall door. It was just an ordinary knock, such as is given hourly by thousands of gentlemen, but it made the professor's heart and mind beat loudly. We looked at each other, and together moved out into the hall. We each held ready to use our various armaments, the spiritual in the left hand, the mortal in the right. Van Helsing pulled back the latch, and holding the door half open, stood back, having both hands ready for action. The gladness of our hearts must have shown upon our faces when on the step, close to the door, we saw Lord Godalming and Quincy Morris. They came quickly in and closed the door behind them, the former saying as they moved along the hall, "'It is all right. We found both places, six boxes in each, and we destroyed them all.' "'Destroyed?' asked the professor. "'For him.' We were silent for a moment, and then Quincy said, "'There's nothing to do but to wait here. If, however, he doesn't turn up by five o'clock, we must start off, for it won't do to leave Mrs. Harker alone after sunset.' "'He will be here before long now,' said Van Helsing, who had been consulting his pocket-book. "'Not bene, in Madame's telegram he went south from Carfax. "'That means he went to cross the river, "'and he could only do so at slack of tide, "'which should be something before one o'clock. "'That he went south has a meaning for us. "'He is as yet only suspicious, "'and he went from Carfax first to the place "'where he would suspect interference least.' You must have been at Bermondsey only a short time before him. That he is not here already shows that he went to Mile End next. This took him some time, for he would then have to be carried over the river in some way. Believe me, my friends, we shall not have long to wait now. We should have ready some plan of attack, so that we may throw away no chance. Hush! There is no time now. Have all your arms. Be ready. He held up a warning hand as he spoke, for we all could hear a key softly inserted in the lock of the hall door. I could not but admire, even at such a moment, the way in which a dominant spirit asserted itself. In all our hunting parties and adventures in different parts of the world, Quincy Morris had always been the one to arrange the plan of action, and Arthur and I had been accustomed to obey him implicitly. Now the old habit seemed to be renewed instinctively. With a swift glance around the room, he at once laid out our plan of attack, and without speaking a word, with a gesture, placed us each in position. Van Helsing, Harker, and I were just behind the door, so that, when it was opened, the professor could guard it whilst we two stepped between the incomer and the door. Godalming behind, and Quincy in front, stood just out of sight, ready to move in front of the window. 
We waited in a suspense that made the seconds pass with nightmare slowness. The slow, careful steps came along the hall. The Count was evidently prepared for some surprise. At least he feared it. Suddenly, with a single bound, he leaped into the room, winning away past us before any of us could raise a hand to stay him. There was something so panther-like in the movement, something so unhuman, that it seemed to sober us all from the shock of his coming. The first to act was Harker, who with a quick movement threw himself before the door leading into the room in front of the house. As the Count saw us, a horrible sort of snarl passed over his face, showing the eye-teeth long and pointed. But the evil smile as quickly passed into a cold stare of lion-like disdain. His expression again changed, as with a single impulse we all advanced upon him. It was a pity that we had not some better organized plan of attack, for even at the moment I wondered what we were going to do. I did not myself know whether our lethal weapons would avail us anything. Harker evidently meant to try the matter, for he had ready his great cookery knife and made a fierce and sudden cut at him. The blow was a powerful one. Only the diabolical quickness of the Count's leap back saved him. A second less and the truncheon blade had shorn through his coat, making a wide gap whence a bundle of banknotes and a stream of gold fell out. The expression of the Count's face was so hellish that for a moment I feared for Harker, though I saw him throw the terrible knife aloft again for another stroke. Instinctively I moved forward with a protective impulse, holding the crucifix and wafer in my left hand. I felt a mighty power fly along my arm, and it was without surprise that I saw the monster cower back before a similar movement made spontaneously by each one of us. It would be impossible to describe the expression of hate and baffled malignity, of anger and hellish rage which came over the Count's face. His waxen hue became greenish-yellow by the contrast of his burning eyes, and the red scar on the forehead showed on the pallid skin like a palpitating wound. The next instant, with a sinuous dive, he swept under Harker's arm ere his blow could fall, and grasping a handful of the money from the floor, dashed across the room, threw himself at the window. Amid the crash and glitter of the falling glass, he tumbled into the flagged area below. Through the sound of the shivering glass I could hear the ching of the gold as some of the sovereigns fell on the flagging. We ran over and saw him sprint unhurt from the ground. He, rushing up the steps, crossed the flag yard and pushed open the stable door. There he turned and spoke to us. "'You think to baffle me with your pale faces all in a row like sheep in a butcher's. You shall be sorry yet, each one of you. You think you have left me without a place to rest. But I have more.' My revenge is just begun. I spread it over centuries, and time is on my side. Your girls that you all love are mine already, and through them you and others shall yet be mine, my creatures, to do my bidding and to be my jackals when I want to feed. Ha! With a contemptuous sneer, he passed quickly through the door, and we heard the rusty bolt creak as he fastened it behind him. A door beyond opened and shut. The first of us to speak was the professor. Realizing the difficulty of following him through the stable, we moved toward the hall. We have learnt something, much. Notwithstanding his brave words, he fears us. He fears time, he fears want. But if not, why he hurry so? His very tone betray him, or my ears deceive. Why take that money? You, follow quick. You are hunters of the wild beast, and understand it so. For me, I make sure that nothing here may be of use to him, if so that he returns. As he spoke, he put the money remaining in his pocket, took the title deeds in the bundle as Harker had left them, and swept the remaining things into the open fireplace, where he set fire to them with a match. Godalming and Morris had rushed out into the yard, and Harker had lowered himself through the window to follow the Count. He had, however, bolted the stable door, and by the time they had forced it open there was no sign of him. Van Helsing and I tried to make inquiry at the back of the house, but the muse was deserted, and no one had seen him depart. It was now late in the afternoon, and sunset was not far off. We had to recognize that our game was up. With heavy hearts, we agreed with the professor when he said, Let us go back to Madamina. Poor, poor dear Madamina. All we can do just now is done, and we can there at least protect her. But we need not despair. There is but one more earth box, and we must try to find it. When that is done... All may yet be well. I could see that he spoke as bravely as he could to comfort Harker. The poor fellow was quite broken down. Now and again he gave a low groan which he could not suppress. He was thinking of his wife. With sad hearts we came back to my house, where we found Mrs. Harker waiting us with an appearance of cheerfulness which did honor to her bravery and unselfishness. When she saw our faces, her own became as pale as death. For a second or two her eyes were closed as if she were in secret prayer. And then she said cheerfully, 
I can never thank you all enough, oh, my poor darling. As she spoke, she took her husband's grey head in her hands and kissed it. Lay your poor head here and rest it. All will yet be well, dear. God will protect us, if he so will it in his good intent. The poor fellow groaned. There was no place for words in his sublime misery. We had a sort of perfunctory supper together, and I think it cheered us all up somewhat. It was, perhaps, the mere animal heat of food to hungry people, for none of us had eaten anything since breakfast, or the sense of companionship may have helped us. But anyhow, we were all less miserable, and saw the morrow as not altogether without hope. True to our promise, we told Mrs. Harker everything which had passed, and although she grew snowy white at times when danger had seemed to threaten her husband, and red at others when his devotion to her was manifested, she listened bravely and with calmness. When we came to the part where Harker had rushed at the council recklessly, she clung to her husband's arm and held it tight as though her clinging could protect him from any harm that might come. She said nothing, however, till the narration was all done, and matters had been brought up to the present time. Then, without letting go of her husband's hand, she stood up amongst us and spoke. Oh, that I could give any idea of the scene, of that sweet, sweet, good, good woman in all the radiant beauty of her youth and animation, with the red scar on her forehead of which she was conscious, and which we saw with grinding of our teeth, remembering whence and how it came, her loving kindness against our grim hate, her tender faith against all our fears and doubting, and we, knowing that so far as symbols went, she with all her goodness and purity and faith was outcast from God. Jonathan, she said, and the words sounded like music on her lips, it was so full of love and tenderness. Jonathan, dear, and you all, my true, true friends, I want you to bear something in mind through all this dreadful time. I know that you must fight, that you must destroy even as you destroyed the false Lucy, so that the true Lucy might live hereafter. But it is not a work of hate. That poor soul who has wrought all this misery is the saddest case of all. Just think what will be his joy when he, too, is destroyed in his worser part, that his better part may have spiritual immortality. You must be pitiful to him, though it may not hold your hands from his destruction. As she spoke, I could see her husband's face darken and draw together, as though the passion in him were shriveling his being to the core. Instinctively, the clasp on his wife's hand grew closer, till his knuckles looked white. She did not flinch from the pain, which I knew she must have suffered, but looked at him with eyes that were more appealing than ever. As she stopped speaking, he leaped to his feet, almost tearing his hand from hers as he spoke. May God give him into my hand just for long enough to destroy that earthly life of him which we are aiming at. If beyond it I could send his soul forever and ever to burning hell, I would do it. Oh, hush! Oh, hush in the name of good God! Don't say such things, Jonathan, my husband, or you will crush me with fear and horror. Just think, my dear. I have been thinking all this long, long day of it, that perhaps some day I, too, may need such pity— and that some other like you, and with equal cause for anger, may deny it to me. Oh, my husband! My husband! Indeed, I would have spared you such a thought had there been another way, but I pray that God may not have treasured your wild words except as the heartbroken wail of a very loving and sorely stricken man. Oh, God, let these poor white hairs go in evidence of what he has suffered, who all his life has done no wrong, and on whom so many sorrows have come. We men were all in tears now. There was no resisting them, and we wept openly. She wept, too, to see that her sweeter counsels had prevailed. Her husband flung himself on his knees beside her, and putting his arms round her, hid his face in the folds of her dress. Van Helsing beckoned to us, and we stole out of the room, leaving the two loving hearts alone with their God. Before they retired, the professor fixed up the room against any coming of the vampire, and assured Mrs. Harker that she might rest in peace. She tried to school herself to the belief, and manifestly, for her husband's sake, tried to seem content. It was a brave struggle, and was, I think and believe, not without its reward. Van Helsing had placed at hand a bell which either of them was to sound in case of any emergency. When they had retired, Quincy, Gildalming, and I arranged that we should sit up, dividing the night between us, and watch over the safety of the poor stricken lady. The first watch falls to Quincy, so the rest of us shall be off to bed as soon as we can. Godalming has already turned in, for his is the second watch. Now that my work is done, I, too, shall go to bed. Jonathan Harker's Journal, 3-4 October, 
close to midnight. I thought yesterday would never end. There was over me a yearning for sleep in some sort of blind relief that to wake would be to find things changed, and that any change must now be for the better. Before we parted we discussed what our next step was to be, but we could arrive at no result. All we knew was that one earth box remained, and that the Count alone knew where it was. If he chooses to lie hidden, he may baffle us for years, and in the meantime the thought is too horrible. I dare not think of it even now. This I know, that if ever there was a woman who was all perfection, that one is my poor, wronged darling. I loved her a thousand times more for her sweet pity of last night, a pity that made my own hate of the monster seem despicable. Surely God will not permit the world to be the poorer by the loss of such a creature. This is hope to me. We are all drifting reefwards now, and our faith is our only anchor. Thank God. Mina is sleeping, and sleeping without dreams. I fear what her dreams might be like with such terrible memories to ground them in. She has not been so calm within my seeing since the sunset. Then, for a while, there came over her face a repose which was like spring after the blasts of March. I thought at the time that it was the softness of the red sunset on her face, but somehow now I think it has a deeper meaning. I am not sleepy myself, though I am weary, weary to death. However, I must try to sleep, for there is tomorrow to think of, and there is no rest for me until... Later. I must have fallen asleep, for I was awakened by Mina, who was sitting up in bed, with a startled look on her face. I could see easily, for we did not leave the room in darkness. She had placed a warning hand over my mouth, and now she whispered in my ear, "'Hush! There is someone in the corridor.' I got up softly, and, crossing the room, gently opened the door. Just outside, stretched on a mattress, lay Mr. Morris, wide awake. He raised a warning hand for silence as he whispered to me, "'Hush! Go back to bed. It is all right. One of us will be here all night. We don't mean to take any chances.' His look and gesture forbade discussion, so I came back and told Mina. She sighed, and positively a shadow of a smile stole over her poor, pale face as she put her arms round me and said softly, "'Oh, thank God for good, brave men!' With a sigh she sank back again to sleep. I write this now as I am not sleepy, though I must try again. 4 October, morning. Once again during the night I was wakened by Mina. This time we had all had a good sleep, for the grey of the coming dawn was making the windows into sharp oblongs, and the gas flame was like a speck rather than a disk of light. She said to me hurriedly, "'Go, call the professor. I want to see him at once.' "'Why?' I asked. "'I have an idea. I suppose it must have come in the night and matured without my knowing it. He must hypnotize me before the dawn, and then I shall be able to speak. Go quick, dearest. The time is getting close.' I went to the door. Dr. Seward was resting on the mattress, and seeing me he sprang to his feet. "'Is anything wrong?' he asked in alarm. "'No,' I replied. "'But Mina wants to see Dr. Van Helsing at once.' "'I will go,' he said, and hurried into the professor's room. Two or three minutes later Van Helsing was in the room in his dressing-gown, and Mr. Morris and Lord Godalming were with Dr. Seward at the door, asking questions. When the professor saw Mina, a smile, a positive smile, ousted the anxiety of his face. He rubbed his hands as he said, "'Oh, my dear Madame Mina, this is indeed a change. See, friend Jonathan, we have got our dear Madame Mina as of old back to us to-day.' Then, turning to her, he said cheerfully, "'And what am I to do for you? For at this hour you do not want me for nothing.' "'I want you to hypnotize me,' she said. "'Do it before the dawn, for I feel that then I can speak and speak freely. Be quick, for the time is short.' Without a word, he motioned her to sit up in bed. Looking fixedly at her, he commenced to make passes in front of her from over the top of her head downward, with each hand in turn. Mina gazed at him fixedly for a few minutes, during which my own heart beat like a trip-hammer, for I felt that some crisis was at hand. Gradually her eyes closed, and she sat stock-still. Only by the gentle heaving of her bosom could one know that she was alive. The professor made a few more passes, and then stopped, and I could see that his forehead was covered with great beads of perspiration. Mina opened her eyes, but she did not seem the same woman. There was a far-away look in her eyes, and her voice had a sad dreaminess which was new to me. Raising his hand to impose silence, the professor motioned to me to bring the others in. They came on tiptoe, closing the door behind them, and stood at the foot of the bed looking on. Mina appeared not to see them. 
The stillness was broken by Van Helsing's voice speaking in a low, level tone which would not break the current of her thoughts. "'There are you?' The answer came in a neutral way. "'I do not know. Sleep has no place it can call its own.' For several minutes there was silence. Mina sat rigid, and the professor stood staring at her fixedly. The rest of us hardly dared to breathe. The room was growing lighter. Without taking his eyes from Mina's face, Dr. Van Helsing motioned me to pull up the blind. I did so, and the day seemed just upon us. A red streak shot up, and a rosy light seemed to diffuse itself through the room. On the instant, the professor spoke again. "'There are you now?' The answer came dreamily, but with intention. It were as though she were interpreting something. I have heard her use the same tone when reading her shorthand notes. "'I do not know. It is all strange to me.' "'What do you see?' "'I can see nothing.' It is all dark. What do you hear? I could detect the strain in the professor's patient voice. The lapping of water. It is gurgling by, and little waves leap. I can hear them on the outside. Then you are on the ship? We all looked at each other, trying to glean something each from the other. We were afraid to think. The answer came quick. Oh, yes. What else do you hear? The sound of men stamping overhead as they run about. There is the creaking of a chain and the loud tinkle as the check of the capstan falls into the ratchet. What are you doing? I am still. Oh, so still. It is like death. The voice faded away into a deep breath as of one sleeping, and the open eyes closed again. By this time the sun had risen, and we were all in the full light of day. Dr. Van Helsing placed his hands on Mina's shoulders and laid her head down softly on her pillow. She lay like a sleeping child for a few moments, and then, with a long sigh, awoke and stared in wonder to see us all around her. "'Have I been talking in my sleep?' was all she said. She seemed, however, to know the situation without telling, though she was eager to know what she had told. The professor repeated the conversation, and she said— "'Then there is not a moment to lose. "'It may not be yet too late.' "'Mr. Morris and Lord Godalming started for the door, "'but the professor's calm voice called them back. "'Stay, my friends. "'That ship, wherever it was, "'was weighing anchor at the moment "'in your so great port of London. "'Which of them is it that you seek? "'God be thanked that we have once again a clue "'to whither it may lead us we know not. "'We have been blind somewhat, "'blind after the manner of men,' Since we can look back, we see what we might have seen looking forward if we had been able to see what we might have seen. Alas, but that sentence is a puddle, is it not? We can know now what was in the Count's mind when he sees that money, though Jonathan's so fierce knife put him in the danger that even he dread. He meant escape. Hear me? Escape! He saw that with but one earth box left and a pack of men following like dogs after a fox, this London was no place for him. He have taken his last earth box on board the ship, and he leave the land. He think to escape, but no, we follow him. Tally-ho, as friend Arthur would say when he put on his red frock, our old fox is vilely, oh, so vilely, and we must follow with vile. I too am vilely, and I think his mind in a little while. In meantime, we may rest and in peace, for there are between us which he do not want to pass, and which he could not if he would. "'Unless the ship were to touch the land, and then only at full or slack tide, see, and the sun is just rose, and all day to sunset is us. Let us take bath and dress and have breakfast which we all need, and which we can eat comfortably, since he be not in the same land with us.' Mina looked at him appealingly as she asked, "'But why need we seek him further when he has gone away from us?' He took her hand and patted it as he replied, "'Ask me nothing as yet.' Then we have breakfast, then I answer all questions. He would say no more, and we separated to dress. After breakfast, Mina repeated her question. He looked at her gravely for a minute, and then said sorrowfully, Because, my dear, dear Madam Mina, now, more than ever, we must find him, even if we have to follow him to the jaws of hell. She grew paler, as she asked faintly, Why? Because... 
he answered solemnly. He can live for centuries, and you are but mortal woman. Time is now to be dreaded, since once he put that mark upon your throat. I was just in time to catch her as she fell forward in a faint. The End of Chapter 23 Dracula by Bram Stoker Chapter 24 Dr. Seward's Phonograph Diary, Spoken by Van Helsing This to Jonathan Harker. You ought to stay with your dear Madame Mina. We shall go to make our search, if I can call it so, for it is not search but knowing, and we seek confirmation only. But do you stay and take care of her today? This is your best and most holiest office. This day nothing can find him here. Let me tell you that so you will know what we four know already, for I have tell them. He, our enemy, have gone away. He have gone back to his castle in Transylvania. I know it so well as if a great hand of fire wrote it on the wall. He have prepared for this in some way, and that last earth box was ready to ship somewheres. For this he took the money. For this he hurry at the last, lest we catch him before the sun go down. It was his last hope, save that he might hide in the tomb, that he think poor Miss Lucy, being as he thought like him, keep open to him. But there was not of time. When that fail, he makes straight for his last resource, his last earthwork, I might say, did I wish double entente, he is clever. Oh, so clever. He know that his game here was finished, and so he decide he go back home. He find a ship going by the route he came, and he go in it. We go off now to find what ship and whither bound. When we have discovered that, we come back and tell you all. Then we will comfort you and poor Madame Mina with new hope. For it will be hope, when you think it over, that all is not lost. This very creature that we pursue, he take hundreds of years to get so far as London. And yet, in one day, when we know of the disposal of him, we drive him out. He is finite, though he is powerful to do much harm and suffers not as we do. But we are strong each in our purpose, and we are all more strong together. Take heart afresh, dear husband of Madame Mina. This battle is but begun, and in the end we shall win. So sure as that God sits on high to watch over his children. Therefore, be of much comfort till we return. Van Helsing Jonathan Harker's Journal 4 October. When I read to Mina Van Helsing's message in the phonograph, the poor girl brightened up considerably. Already the certainty that the Count is out of the country has given her comfort, and comfort is strength to her. For my own part, now that his horrible danger is not face to face with us, it seems almost impossible to believe in it. Even my own terrible experiences in Castle Dracula seem like a long-forgotten dream. Here in the crisp autumn air and the bright sunlight, Alas, how can I disbelieve? In the midst of my thought my eye fell on the red scar on my poor darling's white forehead. Whilst that lasts, there can be no disbelief. Mina and I fear to be idle, so we have been over all the diaries again and again. Somehow, although the reality seems greater each time, the pain and the fear seem less. There is something of a guiding purpose manifest throughout which is comforting. Mina says that perhaps we are the instruments of ultimate good. It may be. I shall try to think as she does. We have never spoken to each other yet of the future. It is better to wait till we see the professor and the others after their investigations. The day is running by more quickly than I ever thought a day could run for me again. It is now three o'clock. Mina Harker's Journal. 5 October. 5 p.m. Our meeting for report. Present, Van Helsing, Lord Godalming, Dr. Seward, Mr. Quincy Morris, Jonathan Harker, Mina Harker. Dr. Van Helsing described what steps were taken during the day to discover on what boat and whither bound Count Dracula made his escape. As I knew that he wanted to get back to Transylvania, I felt sure that he must go by the Danube mouth or by somewhere in the Black Sea, since by that way he come. It was a dreary blank that was before us. Omni ignotum pro magnifico. And so, with heavy hearts, we start to find what ships leave for the Black Sea last night. He was in sailing ship since Madame Mina tells of sails being set. 
These not so important as to go in your list of the shipping in the Times, and so we go, by suggestion of Lord Godalming, to your Lloyd's, where are note of all ships that sail, however so small. There we find that only one black sea-bound ship go out with the tide. She is the Tsarina Catherine, and she sail from Doolittle's Wharf for Varna, and thence to other ports and up the Danube. So, said I, this is the ship where on is the count. So off we go to Doolittle's Wharf, and there we find a man in an office. From him we inquire of the goings of the Tsarina Catherine. He swear much, and he red face and loud of voice, but he good fellow all the same. And then Quincy give him something from his pocket, which crackle as he roll it up, and put it in a so small bag which he have hid deep in his clothing, he still better fellow and humble servant to us. He come with us, and ask many men who are rough and hot. These be better fellows too, when they have been no more thirsty. They say much of blood and bloom, and of others which I comprehend not, though I guess what they mean. But nevertheless, they tell us all things which we want to know. They make known to us among them how last afternoon, at about five o'clock, comes a man so hurry, a tall man, thin and pale, with high nose and teeth so white and eyes that seem to be burning, that he be all in black except that he have a hat of straw which suit not him all the time, that he scatter his money in making quick inquiry as to what ship sails for the Black Sea and for where. Some took him to the office and then to the ship, where he will not go aboard, but halt at shore at end of gangplank and ask that the captain come to him. The captain come, when told that he will be pay well, and though he swear much at the first, he agreed to turn. Then the tin man go, and someone tell him where horse and cart can be hired. He go there, and soon he come again, himself driving cart on which a great box. This he himself lift down, though it takes several to put it on truck for ship. He give much talk to captain as to how and where his box is to be placed. But the captain like it not, and swear at him in many tongues, and tell him that if he like, he can come and see where it shall be. But he say no, that he come not yet, for that he have much to do. Whereupon the captain tell him that he had better be quick with blood, for that his ship will leave the place of blood before the turn of the tide with blood. Then the tin man smile and say that of course he must go when he think fit, but he will be surprised if he go quite so soon. The captain swear again, polyglot, and the tin man make him bow and thank him, and say that he will so far intrude on his kindness as to come aboard before the sailing. Final, the captain, more red than ever, and in more tongues, tell him that he doesn't want no Frenchman with bloom upon them, and also with blood in his ship with blood on her also. And so after asking where he might purchase ship forms, he departed. No one knew where he went, or Bloomin' well cared, as they said, for they had something else to think of, well, with blood again, for it soon became apparent to all that the Tsarina Catherine would not sail as was expected. A thin mist began to creep up from the river, and it grew and grew, till soon a dense fog enveloped the ship and all around her. The captain swore polyglot, very polyglot, polyglot with bloom and blood, but he could do nothing. The water rose and rose, and he began to fear that he would lose the tide altogether. He was in no friendly mood when, just at full tide, the tin man came up the gangplank again and asked to see where his box had been stowed. Then the captain replied that he wished that he and his box, old and with much bloom and blood, were in hell. But the tin man did not be offended and went down with the mate and saw where it was placed and came up and stood a while on deck in fog. He must have come off by himself, for none noticed him. Indeed, they thought not of him, for soon the fog began to melt away, and all was clear again. My friends of the thirst and the language that was of bloom and blood laughed, as they told how the captain's swears exceeded even his usual polyglot, and was more than ever full of picturesque when on questioning other mariners who were on movement up and down the river that hour, he found that few of them had seen any of fog at all, except where it lay round the wharf. However, the ship went out on the ebb tide, and was doubtless by morning far down the river mouth. She was then, when they told us, well out to sea. And so, my dear Madam Mina, it is that we have to rest for a time, for our enemy is on the sea with the fog at his command, on his way to the Danube mouth. To sail a ship takes time, go she never so quick, and when we start to go on land more quick, 
and we meet him there. Our best hope is to come on him when in the box between sunrise and sunset, for then he can make no struggle, and we may deal with him as we should. There are days for us in which we can make ready our plan. We know all about where he go, for we have seen the owner of the ship, who have shown us invoices and all papers that can be. The box we seek is to be landed in Varna, and to be given to an agent, one Ristix, who will there present his credentials. And so our merchant friend will have done his part. When he asks if there can be any wrong, for that so he can telegraph and have inquiry made at Varna, we say no, for what is to be done is not for police or the customs. It must be done by us alone and in our own way. When Dr. Van Helsing had done speaking, I asked him if he was certain that the Count had remained on board the ship. He replied, We have the best evidence proof of that, your own evidence, when in the hypnotic trance this morning. I asked him again if it were really necessary that they should pursue the Count, for, oh, I dread Jonathan leaving me, and I know that he would surely go if the others went. He answered in growing passion at first quietly. As he went on, however, he grew more angry and more forceful, till in the end we could not but see wherein was at least some of that personal dominance which made him so long a master amongst men. Yes, it is necessary, 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 for your sake in the first and then for the sake of humanity. This monster has done much harm already in the narrow scope where he finds himself, and in the short time when as yet he was only as a body groping his so small measure in darkness and not knowing. All this I have told these others. You, my dear Madamina, will learn it in the phonograph of my friend John or in that of your husband. I have told them how the measure of leaving his own barren land, the barren of peoples, and coming to a new land where life of man teems till they are like the multitude of standing corn, was the work of centuries, were another of the undead, like him, to try to do what he has done. Perhaps not all the centuries of the world that have been or that will be could aid him. With this one, all the forces of nature that are occult and deep and strong must have worked together in some wondrous way. The very place where he have been alive, undead for all these centuries, is full of strangeness of the geologic and chemical world. There are deep caverns and fissures that reach none, no, whither. There have been volcanoes, some of whose openings still send out waters of strange properties and gases that kill or make to vivify. Doubtless there is something magnetic or electric in some of these combinations of occult forces which work for physical life in strange way, and in himself were from the first some great qualities. In a hard and warlike time he was celebrated that he have more iron nerve, more subtle brain, more braver heart than any man. In him some vital principle have in strange way found their utmost, and as his body keeps strong and grow and thrive, so his brain grow too. All this without that diabolic aid which is surely to him. For it have to yield to the powers that come from and are symbolic of good. And now this is what he is to us. He have in fact you, oh, forgive me, my dear, that I must say such, but it is for good of you that I speak. He in fact you in such wise that even if he do no more, you have only to live, to live in your own old sweet way, and so in time death which is of man's common lot and with God's sanction, shall make you like to him. This must not be. We have sworn together that it must not. Thus we are ministers of God's own wish, that the world and men for whom his son die will not be given over to monsters whose very existence would defame him. He have allowed us to redeem one soul already, and we go out as the old knights of the cross to redeem more. Like them, we shall travel towards the sunrise, and like them, if we fail, we fail in good cause. He paused, and I said, But will not the Count take his rebuff wisely? Since he has been driven from England, will he not avoid it as a tiger does the village from which he has been hunted? Ah, he said, Your simile of the tiger good for me, and I shall adopt him. Your man-eater, as they of India call the tiger, who has once tasted blood of the human, care no more for other prey, but prowl unceasingly till he get him. This that we hunt from our village is a tiger, too, a man-eater, and he never ceased to prowl, nay, in himself 
He is not one to retire and stay afar. In his life, his living life, he go over the Turkey frontier and attack his enemy on his own ground. He be beaten back, but then he stay. No, he come again and again and again. Look at his persistence and endurance. With the child brain that was to him, he have long since conceived the idea of coming to great city. What does he do? He find out the place of all the world most of promise for him. Then he deliberately set himself down to prepare for the task. He find in patience just how is his strength and what are his powers. He study new tongues. He learn new social life, new environment of old ways, the politics, the law, the finance, the science, the habit of a new land and the new people who have come to be since he was. His glimpse that he have had wet his appetite only and in keen his desire. Nay, it help him to grow as to his brain, for it all proved to him how right he was at the first in his surmises. He have done this alone, all alone, from a ruined tomb in a forgotten land. What more may he not do when the greater world of thought is open to him? He that can smile at death as we know him, who can flourish in the midst of diseases that kill off whole peoples? Oh, if such an one was to come from God and not the devil, what a force for good might he not be in this old world of ours? But we are pledged to set the world free. Our toil must be in silence and our efforts all in secret. For in this enlightened age, when men believe not even what they see, the doubting of wise men would be his greatest strength. It would be at once his sheet and his armor and his weapons to destroy us, his enemies, who are willing to peril even our own souls for the safety of one we love, for the good of mankind, and for the honor and glory of God. After a general discussion, it was determined that for tonight nothing be definitely settled, that we should all sleep on the facts and try to think out the proper conclusions. Tomorrow at breakfast we ought to meet again, and after making our conclusions known to one another, we shall decide on some definite cause of action. I feel a wonderful peace and rest tonight. It is as if some haunting presence were removed from me. Perhaps my surmise was not finished, could not be, for I caught sight in the mirror of the red mark upon my forehead, and I knew that I was still unclean. Dr. Seward's Diary 5 October we all arose early, and I think that sleep did much for each and all of us. When we met at early breakfast, there was more general cheerfulness than any of us had ever expected to experience again. It is really wonderful how much resilience there is in human nature. Let any obstructing cause, no matter what, be removed in any way, even by death, and we fly back to first principles of hope and enjoyment. More than once, as we sat around the table, my eyes opened in wonder whether the whole of the past days had not been a dream. It was only when I caught sight of the red blotch on Mrs. Harker's forehead that I was brought back to reality. Even now, when I am gravely resolving the matter, it is almost impossible to realize that the cause of all our trouble is still existent. Even Mrs. Harker seems to lose sight of her trouble for whole spells. It is only now and again when something recalls it to her mind that she thinks of her terrible scar. We ought to meet here in my study in half an hour and decide on our course of action. I see only one immediate difficulty— I know it by instinct rather than reason. We shall all have to speak frankly, and yet I fear that in some mysterious way poor Mrs. Harker's tongue is tied. I know that she forms conclusions of her own, and from all that has been I can guess how brilliant and how true they must be. But she will not, or cannot, give them utterance. I have mentioned this to Van Helsing, and he and I ought to talk it over when we are alone. I suppose it is some of that horrid poison which has got into her veins beginning to work. The Count had his own purposes when he gave her what Van Helsing called the vampire's baptism of blood. Well, there may be a poison that distills itself out of good things. In an age where the existence of Tomains is a mystery, we should not wonder at anything. One thing I know, that if my instinct be true regarding poor Mrs. Harker's silences, then there is a terrible difficulty and unknown danger in the work before us. The same power that compels her silence may compel her speech. I dare not think further— for so I should in my thoughts dishonor a noble woman. Later. When the professor came in, we talked over the state of things. I could see that he had something on his mind which he wanted to say, but felt some hesitancy about broaching the subject. After beating about the bush a little, he said, Friend John, 
there is something that you and I must talk of alone, just at the first, at any rate. Later, we may have to take the others into our confidence. Then he stopped, so I waited. He went on. Madame Mina, our poor dear Madame Mina, is changing. A cold shiver ran through me to find my worst fears thus endorsed. Van Helsing continued. With the sad experience of Miss Lucy, we must this time be warned before things go too far. Our task is now in reality more difficult than ever, and this new trouble makes every hour of the direst importance. I can see the characteristics of the vampire coming in her face. It is now but very, very slight, but it is to be seen if we have eyes to notice without prejudge. Her teeth are sharper, and at times her eyes are more hard. But these are not all. There is to her the silence now often, as so it was with Miss Lucy. She did not speak even when she wrote that which she wished to be known later. Now my fear is this. If it be that she can, by our hypnotic trance, tell what the Count see and hear, is it not more true that he who have hypnotized her first, and who have drink of her very blood and make her drink of his, should, if he will, compel her mind to disclose to him that which she know? I nodded acquiescence. He went on. Then what we must do is to prevent this. We must keep her ignorant of our intent, and so she cannot tell what she know not. This is painful task. Oh, so painful that it heartbreak me to think of it, but it must be. When today we meet, I must tell her that for reason which we will not speak, she must not more be of our counsel, but be simply guarded by us. He wiped his forehead, which had broken out in profuse perspiration at the thought of the pain which he might have to inflict upon the poor soul already so tortured. I knew that it would be some sort of comfort to him if I told him that I also had come to the same conclusion, for at any rate it would take away the pain of doubt. I told him, and the effect was as I expected. It is now close to the time of our general gathering. Van Helsing has gone away to prepare for the meeting and his painful part of it. I really believe his purpose is to be able to pray alone. Later. At the very outset of our meeting, a great personal relief was experienced by both Van Helsing and myself. Mrs. Harker had sent a message by her husband to say that she would not join us at present, as she thought it better that we should be free to discuss our movements without her presence to embarrass us. The professor and I looked at each other for an instant, and somehow we both seemed relieved. For my own part, I thought that if Mrs. Harker realized the danger herself, it was much pain as well as much danger averted. Under the circumstances, we agreed, by a questioning look and answer, with finger on lip, to preserve silence in our suspicions until we should have been able to confer alone again. We went at once into our plan of campaign. Van Helsing roughly put the facts before us first. The Tsarina Catherine left the Thames yesterday morning. It will take her at the quickest speed she has ever made at least three weeks to reach Varna. But we can travel overland to the same place in three days. Now, if we allow for two days less for the ship's voyage, owing to such weather influences as we know that the Count can bring to bear, and if we allow a whole day and night for any delays which may occur to us, then we have a margin of nearly two weeks. Thus, in order to be quite safe, we must leave here on seventeenth at latest. Then we shall at any rate be in Varna a day before the ship arrives, and able to make such preparations as may be necessary. Of course, we shall all go armed, armed against evil things, spiritual as well as physical. Here, Quincy Morris added, I understand that the Count comes from a wolf country, and it may be that he shall get there before us. I propose that we add Winchesters to our armament. I have a kind of belief in a Winchester when there is any trouble of that sort around. Do you remember, Art, when we had the pack after us at Tobolsk? What wouldn't we have given then for a repeater apiece? Good, said Van Helsing. Winchester's it shall be. Quincy's head is at level at times, but most so when there is to hunt, metaphor be more dishonor to science than wolves be of danger to man. In the meantime we can do nothing here, and as I think that Varna is not familiar to any of us, why not go there more soon? It is as long to wait here as there. Tonight and tomorrow we can get ready, and then, if all be well, we four can set out on our journey. We four, said Harker interrogatively, looking from one to another of us. Of course, answered the professor quickly, you must remain here to take care of your so sweet wife. 
Harker was silent for a while, and then he said in a hollow voice, "'Let us talk of that part of it in the morning. I want to consult with Mina.' I thought that now was the time for Van Helsing to warn him not to disclose our plan to her, but he took no notice. I looked at him significantly and coughed. For answer, he put his finger to his lips and turned away. Jonathan Harker's Journal October, Afternoon For some time after our meeting this morning, I could not think. The new phases of things leave my mind in a state of wonder which allows no room for active thought. Mina's determination not to take any part in the discussion set me thinking, and as I could not argue the matter with her, I could only guess. I am as far as ever from a solution now. The way the others received it, too, puzzled me. The last time we talked on the subject, we agreed that there was to be no more concealment of anything amongst us. Mina is sleeping now, calmly and sweetly, like a little child. Her lips are curved, and her face beams with happiness. Thank God there are such moments still for her. Later. How strange it all is. I sat watching Mina's happy sleep, and I came as near to being happy myself as I suppose I shall ever be. As the evening drew on, and the earth took its shadows from the sun sinking lower, the silence of the room grew more and more solemn to me. All at once Mina opened her eyes, and looking at me tenderly said, "'Jonathan,' I want you to promise me something on your word of honour, a promise made to me but made holily in God's hearing, and not to be broken, though I should go down on my knees and implore you with bitter tears. Quick, you must make it to me at once. Mina, I said, a promise like that I cannot make at once. I may have no right to make it. But, dear one, she said, with such spiritual intensity that her eyes were like pole stars, it is I who wish it, and it is not for myself. "'You can ask Dr. Van Helsing if I am not right. "'If he disagrees, you may do as you will. "'Nay, more, if you all agree, later you are absolved from the promise.' "'I promise,' I said, and for a moment she looked supremely happy, "'though to me all happiness for her was denied by the red scar on her forehead. "'She said, "'Promise me that you will not tell me anything of the plans formed for the campaign against the Count, "'not by word, or inference, or implication, not at any time whilst this remains to me.' and she solemnly pointed to the scar. I saw that she was in earnest, and said solemnly, I promise, and as I said it, I felt that from that instant a door had been shut between us. Later. Midnight. Mina has been bright and cheerful all the evening, so much so that all the rest seemed to take courage, as if infected somewhat with her gaiety. As a result, even I myself felt as if the pall of gloom which weighs us down were somewhat lifted. We all retired early. Mina is now sleeping like a little child. It is wonderful that her faculty of sleep remains to her in the midst of her terrible trouble. Thank God for it, for then at least she can forget her care. Perhaps her example may affect me as her gaiety did tonight. I shall try it. Oh, for a dreamless sleep! 6 October, morning. Another surprise. Mina woke me early, about the same time as yesterday, and asked me to bring Dr. Van Helsing. I thought that it was another occasion for hypnotism, and without question went for the professor. He had evidently expected some such call, for I found him dressed in his room. His door was ajar, so that he could hear the opening of the door of our room. He came at once. As he passed into the room, he asked Mina if the others might come too. No, she said quite simply, it will not be necessary. You can tell them just as well. I must go with you on your journey." Dr. Van Helsing was as startled as I was. After a moment's pause, he asked, "'But why?' "'You must take me with you. I am safer with you, and you shall be safer too.' "'But why, dear Madame Mina? You know that your safety is our solemnest duty. We go into danger to which you are or may be more liable than any of us from—from from circumstances, uh, things that have been.' He paused, embarrassed. As she replied, she raised her finger and pointed to her forehead. I know. That is why I must go. I can tell you now, whilst the sun is coming up. I may not be able again. I know that when the Count wills me, I must go. I know that if he tells me to come in secret, I must by wile. By any device to hoodwink even Jonathan. God saw the look that she turned on me as she spoke, 
and if there be indeed a recording angel, that look is noted to her everlasting honour. I could only clasp her hand. I could not speak. My emotion was too great for even the relief of tears. She went on. You men are brave and strong. You are strong in your numbers, for you can defy that which would break down the human endurance of one who has to guard alone. Besides, I may be of service, since you can hypnotize me, and so learn that which even I myself do not know. Dr. Van Helsing said gravely, Madam Mina, you are, as always, most wise. You shall come with us, and together we shall do that which we can go forth to achieve. When he had spoken, Mina's long spell of silence made me look at her. She had fallen back on her pillow asleep. She did not even wake when I had pulled up the blind and let in the sunlight which flooded the room. Van Helsing motioned to me to come with him quietly. We went to his room, and within a minute Lord Godalming, Dr. Seward, and Mr. Morris were with us also. He told them what Mina had said, and went on. In the morning we shall leave for Varna. We have now to deal with a new factor, Madame Mina. Oh, but her soul is true. It is to her an agony to tell us so much as she has done, but it is most right, and we are warned in time. There must be no chance lost, and in Varna we must be ready to act the instant when that ship arrives. What shall we do exactly? asked Mr. Morris laconically. The professor paused before replying. We shall at the first board that ship. Then, when we have identified the box, we shall place a branch of the wild rose on it. This we shall fasten, for when it is there, none can emerge, so that at least says the superstition, and to superstition must we trust at the first. It was man's faith in the early, and it have its root in faith still. Then, when we get the opportunity that we seek, when none are near to see, we shall open the box, and, and all will be well. I shall not wait for any opportunity, said Morris. When I see the box, I shall open it and destroy the monster, though there are a thousand men looking on, and if I am to be wiped out for it the next moment. I grasped his hand instinctively, and found it as firm as a piece of steel. I think he understood my look. I hope he did. Good boy, said Dr. Van Helsing. Brave boy. Quincy is all man. God bless him for it. My child, believe me, None of us shall lag behind or pause from any fear. I do but say what we may do, what we must do. But indeed, indeed, we cannot say what we may do. There are so many things which may happen, and their ways and their ends are so various that until the moment we may not say. We shall all be armed in all ways, and when the time for the end has come, our effort shall not be lack. Now let us today put all our affairs in order." Let all things which touch on others dear to us and who on us depend be complete, for none of us can tell what or when or how the end may be. As for me, my own affairs are regulate, and as I have nothing else to do, I shall go make arrangements for the travel. I shall have all tickets and so forth for our journey. There was nothing further to be said, and we parted. I shall now settle up all my affairs of earth and be ready for whatever may come later. It is done. My will is made, and all complete. Mina, if she survive, is my sole heir. If it should not be so, then the others who have been so good to us shall have remainder. It is now drawing towards the sunset. Mina's uneasiness calls my attention to it. I am sure that there is something on her mind which the time of exact sunset will reveal. These occasions are becoming harrowing times for us all, for each sunrise and sunset opens up some new danger, some new pain, which, however, may in God's will be means to a good end. I write all these things in the diary, since my darling must not hear them now. But if it may be that she can see them again, they shall be ready. She is calling to me. The End of Chapter 24 Dracula by Bram Stoker Chapter 25 Dr. Seward's Diary 11 October, Evening Jonathan Harker has asked me to note this, as he says he is hardly equal to the task, and he wants an exact record kept. I think that none of us were surprised when we were asked to see Mrs. Harker a little before the time of sunset. 
We have of late come to understand that sunrise and sunset are to her times of peculiar freedom, when her old self can be manifest without any controlling force subduing or restraining her or inciting her to action. This mood or condition begins some half hour or more before actual sunrise or sunset and lasts till either the sun is high or whilst the clouds are still aglow with the rays streaming above the horizon. At first there is a sort of negative condition, as if some tie were loosened, and then the absolute freedom quickly follows. When, however, the freedom ceases, the change back or relapse comes quickly, preceded only by a spell of warning silence. Tonight, when we met, she was somewhat constrained, and bore all the signs of an internal struggle. I put it down myself to her making a violent effort at the earliest instant she could do so. A very few minutes, however, gave her complete control of herself. Then... Motioning her husband to sit beside her on the sofa, where she was half reclining, she made the rest of us bring chairs up close. Taking her husband's hand in hers, she began, We are all here together in freedom for perhaps the last time. I know that you will always be with me to the end. This was to her husband, whose hand had, as we could see, tightened upon her. In the morning, we go out upon our task, and God alone knows what may be in store for any of us. You are going to be so good to me to take me with you. I know that all that brave, earnest men can do for a poor, weak woman whose soul perhaps is lost, no, no, not yet, but is at any rate at stake, you will do. But you must remember that I am not as you are. There is a poison in my blood, in my soul, which may destroy me, which must destroy me, unless some relief comes to us. Oh, my friends, you know as well as I do that my soul is at stake. And though I know there is one way out for me, you must not, and I must not take it. She looked appealingly to us all in turn, beginning and ending with her husband. "'What is that they?' asked Van Helsing in a hoarse voice. "'What is that they which we must not, may not take?' "'That I may die now, either by my own hand or that of another, before the greater evil is entirely wrought. I know, and you know, that were I once dead you could and would set free my immortal spirit, even as you did my poor Lucy's. Were death or the fear of death the only thing that stood in the way, I would not shrink to die here now amidst the friends who love me. But death is not all. I cannot believe that to die in such a case, when there is hope before us and a bitter task to be done, is God's will. Therefore, I on my part give up here the certainty of eternal rest, and go out into the dark where may be the blackest things that the world or the nether world holds. We were all silent for we knew instinctively that this was only a prelude. The faces of the others were set, and Harker's grew ashen grey. Perhaps he guessed better than any of us what was coming. She continued, This is what I can give into the hotchpot. I could not but note the quaint legal phrase which she used in such a place and with all seriousness. What will each of you give? Your lives, I know, she went on quickly. That is easy for brave men. Your lives are God's, and you can give them back to him. "'But what will you give to me?' "'She looked again questioningly, "'but this time avoided her husband's face. "'Quincy seemed to understand. "'He nodded, and her face lit up. "'Then I shall tell you plainly what I want, "'for there must be no doubtful matter "'in this connection between us now. "'You must promise me, one and all, "'even you, my beloved husband, "'that should the time come, you will kill me. "'What is that time?' The voice was Quincy's, but now it was low and strained. "'When you shall be convinced that I am so changed "'that it is better that I die that I may live. "'When I am thus dead in the flesh, "'then you will, without a moment's delay, "'drive a stake through me and cut off my head, "'or do whatever else may be wanting to give me rest.' "'Quincy was the first to rise after the pause. "'He knelt down before her, and taking her hand in his, said solemnly, I'm only a rough fellow who hasn't perhaps lived as a man should to win such a distinction. But I swear to you, by all that I hold sacred and dear, that should the time ever come, I shall not flinch from the duty that you have set us. And I promise you, too, that I shall make all certain, for if I am only doubtful, I shall take it that the time has come. My true friend, was all she could say amid her fast-falling tears, as bending over, she kissed his hand. "'I sweared the same, my dear Madam Mina,' said Van Helsing. "'And I,' said Lord Godalming, each of them in turn, kneeling to her to take the oath. "'I followed myself. 
Then her husband turned to her wan-eyed and with a greenish pallor which subdued the snowy whiteness of his hair and asked, And must I too make such a promise, O my wife? You too, my dearest, she said with infinite yearning of pity in her voice and eyes. You must not shrink. You are nearest and dearest and all the world to me. Our souls are knit into one for all life and all time. Think, dear, that there have been times when brave men have killed their wives and their womenkind to keep them from falling into the hands of the enemy. Their hands did not falter any the more because those that they loved implored them to slay them. It is men's duty towards those women they love in such times of sore trial. And, oh, my dear, if it is to be that I must meet death at any hand, let it be at the hand of him that loves me best. Dr. Van Helsing, I have not forgotten your mercy in poor Lucy's case to him who loved. She stopped with a flying blush, and changed her phrase to him who had best right to give her peace. If that time shall come again, I look to you to make it a happy memory of my husband's life that it was his loving hand which set me free from the awful thrall upon me. Again, I swear, came the professor's resonant voice. Mrs. Harker smiled, positively smiled, as with a sigh of relief, she leaned back and said, And now one word of warning, a warning which you must never forget. The time, if it ever come, may come quickly and unexpectedly, and in such case you must lose no time in using your opportunity. At such a time I myself might be. Nay, if the time ever come shall be, lead with your enemy against you. One more request. She became very solemn as she said this. It is not vital and necessary like the other, but I want you to do one thing for me, if you will. We all acquiesced, but no one spoke. There was no need to speak. I want you to read the burial service. She was interrupted by a deep groan from her husband. Taking his hand in hers, she held it over her heart and continued, You must read it over me some day. Whatever may be the issue of all this fearful state of things, it will be a sweet thought to all or some of us. You, my dearest, will I hope read it, for then it will be in your voice in my memory forever, come what may. But, oh, my dear one, he pleaded, death is afar off from you. Nay, she said, holding up a warning hand, I am deeper in death at this moment than if the weight of an earthly grave lay heavy upon me. Oh, my wife, must I read it, he said before he began. It would comfort me, my husband, was all she said, and he began to read when she had got the book ready. How can I, how could any one tell of that strange scene its solemnity, its gloom, its sadness, its horror, and with all its sweetness? Even a skeptic, who can see nothing but a travesty of bitter truth in anything holy or emotional, would have been melted to the heart had he seen that little group of loving and devoted friends kneeling round that stricken and sorrowing lady, or hear the tender passion of her husband's voice, as in tones so broken and emotional that often he had to pause he read the simple and beautiful service from the burial of the dead. I cannot go on. Words and voices fail me. She was right in her instinct. Strange as it was, bizarre as it may hereafter seem even to us who felt its potent influence at the time, it comforted us much. And the silence which showed Mrs. Harker's coming relapse from her freedom of soul did not seem so full of despair to any of us as we had dreaded. Jonathan Harker's Journal 15 October, Varna we left Charing Cross on the morning of the 12th, got to Paris the same night, and took the places secured for us in the Orient Express. We travelled night and day, arriving here at about five o'clock. Lord Godalming went to the consulate to see if any telegram had arrived for him, whilst the rest of us came on to this hotel, the Odessus. The journey may have had incidents. I was, however, too eager to get on to care for them. Until the Tsarina Catherine comes into port, there will be no interest for me in anything in the wide world. Thank God! Mina is well, and looks to be getting stronger. Her colour is coming back. She sleeps a great deal. Throughout the journey she slept nearly all the time. Before sunrise and sunset, however, she is very wakeful and alert, and it has become a habit for Van Helsing to hypnotise her at such times. At first some effort was needed, and he had to make many passes. But now she seems to yield at once as if by habit, and scarcely any action is needed. He seems to have power at these particular moments to simply will and her thoughts obey him. He always asks her what she can see and hear. 
She answers to the first, nothing, all is dark. And to the second, I can hear the waves lapping against the ship and the water rushing by. Canvas and cordage strain and masts and yards creak. The wind is high. I can hear it in the shrouds, and the bow throws back the foam. It is evident that the Tsarina Catherine is still at sea, hastening on her way to Varna. Lord Godalming has just returned. He had four telegrams, one each day since we started, and all to the same effect, that the Tsarina Catherine had not been reported to Lloyd's from anywhere. He had arranged before leaving London that his agent should send him every day a telegram saying if the ship had been reported. He was to have a message, even if she were not reported, so that he might be sure that there was a watch being kept at the other end of the wire. We had dinner and went to bed early. Tomorrow we ought to see the vice-consul and to arrange, if we can, about getting on board the ship as soon as she arrives. Van Helsing says that our chance will be to get on the boat between sunrise and sunset. The Count, even if he takes the form of a bat, cannot cross the running water of his own volition, and so cannot leave the ship. As he dare not change to man's form without suspicion, which he evidently wishes to avoid, he must remain in the box. If then we can come on board after sunrise, he is at our mercy, for we can open the box and make sure of him, as we did of poor Lucy before he wakes. What mercy he shall get from us all will not count for much. We think that we shall not have much trouble with officials or the seamen, Thank God. This is the country where bribery can do anything, and we are well supplied with money. We have only to make sure that the ship cannot come into port between sunset and sunrise without our being warned, and we shall be safe. Judge Moneybag will settle this case, I think. 16 October Mina's report still the same. Lapping waves and rushing water, darkness and favoring winds. We are evidently in good time, and when we hear of the Tsarina Catherine, we shall be ready. As she must pass the Dardanelles, we are sure to have some report. 17 October. Everything is pretty well fixed now, I think, to welcome the Count on his return from his tour. Godalming told the shippers that he fancied that the box sent abroad might contain something stolen from a friend of his, and got a half-consent that he might open it at his own risk. The owner gave him a paper telling the captain to give him every facility in doing whatever he chose on board the ship, and also a similar authorization to his agent at Varna. We have seen the agent, who was much impressed with Godalming's kindly manner to him, and we are all satisfied that whatever he can do to aid our wishes will be done. We have already arranged what to do in case we get the box open. If the Count is there, Van Helsing and Seward will cut off his head at once and drive a stake through his heart. "'Morris and Godalming and I shall prevent interference, "'even if we have to use the arms, which we shall have ready. "'The professor says that if we can so treat the Count's body, "'it will soon after fall into dust. "'In such case there would be no evidence against us "'in case any suspicion of murder were aroused. "'But even if it were not, we should stand or fall by our act, "'and perhaps some day this very script may be evidence "'to come between some of us and a rope. "'For myself I should take the chance only too thankfully "'if it were to come.' We mean to leave no stone unturned to carry out our intent. We have arranged with certain officials that the instant the Tsarina Catherine is seen, we ought to be informed by a special messenger. 24 October. A whole week of waiting. Daily telegrams to Godalming, but only the same story. Not yet reported. Mina's morning and evening hypnotic answer is unvaried. Lapping waves... "'rushing water and creaking masts. "'Telegram. "'October 24th. "'Rufus Smith, Lloyds, London, "'to Lord Godalming, care of HBM Vice-Consul, Varna. "'Sarina Catherine reported this morning from Dardanelles. "'Dr. Seward's Diary. "'25 October. "'How I miss my phonograph.' To write a diary with a pen is irksome to me, but Van Helsing says I must. We were all wild with excitement yesterday when Godalming got his telegram from Lloyd's. I know now what men feel in battle when the call to action is heard. Mrs. Harker, alone of our party, did not show any signs of emotion. After all, it is not strange that she did not, for we took special care not to let her know anything about it, and we all tried not to show any excitement when we were in her presence." In old days she would, I am sure, have noticed, no matter how we might have tried to conceal it. But in this way she has greatly changed during the past three weeks. 
the lethargy grows upon her, and though she seems strong and well, and is getting back some of her colour, Van Helsing and I are not satisfied. We talk of her often. We have not, however, said a word to the others. It would break poor Harker's heart, certainly his nerve, if he knew that we had even a suspicion on the subject. Van Helsing examines, he tells me, her teeth very carefully, whilst she is in the hypnotic condition, for he says that so long as they do not begin to sharpen, there is no active danger of a change in her. If this change should come, it would be necessary to take steps. We both know what those steps would have to be, though we do not mention our thoughts to each other. We should neither of us shrink from the task, awful though it may be to contemplate. Euthanasia is an excellent and a comforting word. I am grateful to whoever invented it. It is only about twenty-four hours sail from the Dardanelles to here, at the rate that Tsarina Catherine has come from London. She shall therefore arrive some time in the morning, but as she cannot possibly get in before noon, we are all about to retire early. We shall get up at one o'clock so as to be ready. 25 October. Noon. No news yet of the ship's arrival. Mrs. Harker's hypnotic report this morning was the same as usual, so it is possible that we may get news at any moment. We men are all in a fever of excitement, except Harker, who is calm. His hands are cold as ice, and an hour ago I found him wetting the edge of the great Gorka knife which he now always carries with him. It will be a bad lookout for the Count, if the edge of that cookery ever touches his throat, driven by that stern, ice-cold hand. Van Helsing and I were a little alarmed about Mrs. Harker to-day, about noon she got into a sort of lethargy which we did not like. Although we kept silence to the others, we were neither of us happy about it. She had been restless all the morning, so that we were at first glad to know that she was sleeping. When, however, her husband mentioned casually that she was sleeping so soundly that he could not wake her, we went to her room to see for ourselves. She was breathing naturally and looked so well and peaceful that we agreed that the sleep was better for her than anything else. Poor girl! She has so much to forget that it is no wonder that sleep, if it brings oblivion to her, does her good. Later. Our opinion was justified, for when, after a refreshing sleep of some hours, she woke up, she seemed brighter and better than she had been for days. At sunset, she made the usual hypnotic report. Wherever he may be in the Black Sea, the Count is hurrying to his destination, to his doom, I trust. 26 October. Another day, and no tidings of the Tsarina Catherine. She ought to be here by now. That she is still journeying somewhere is apparent, for Mrs. Harker's hypnotic report at sunrise was still the same. It is possible that the vessel may be lying by at times for fog. Some of the steamers which came in last evening reported patches of fog both to north and south of the port. We must continue our watching, as the ship may now be signalled at any moment. 27 October noon. Most strange. No news yet of the ship we wait for. Mrs. Harker reported last night and this morning as usual. Lapping waves and rushing water, though she added that the waves were very faint. The telegrams from London have been the same. No further report. Van Helsing is terribly anxious, and told me just now that he fears the Count is escaping us. He added significantly, I did not like that lethargy of Madame Minas. "'Souls and memories can do strange things during trance.' "'I was about to ask him more, but Harker just then came in, "'and he held up a warning hand. "'We must try tonight at sunset to make her speak more fully "'when in her hypnotic state.' 28 October Telegram, Rufus Smith, London, to Lord Godalming, Care, HBM, Vice-Consul, Varna. Tsarina Catherine, Reported entering Galatz at one o'clock today. Dr. Seward's Diary. 28 October. When the telegram came announcing the arrival in Galatz, I do not think it was such a shock to any of us as might have been expected. True, we did not know whence or how or when the bolt would come. But I think we all expected that something strange would happen. The day of arrival at Varna made us individually satisfied that things would not be just as we had expected. We only waited to learn where the change would occur. Nonetheless, however it was a surprise, I suppose that nature works on such a hopeful basis that we believe against ourselves that things will be as they ought to be, not as we should know that they will be. 
Transcendentalism is a beacon to the angels, even it be a will-o'-the-wisp to man. Van Helsing raised his hand over his head for a moment, as though in remonstrance with the Almighty, but he said not a word, and in a few seconds stood up with his face sternly set. Lord Godalming grew very pale and sat breathing heavily. I was myself half stunned and looked in wonder at one after another. Quincy Morris tightened his belt with that quick movement which I knew so well. In our old wandering days it meant action. Mrs. Harker grew ghastly white so that the scar on her forehead seemed to burn, but she folded her hands meekly and looked up in prayer. Harker smiled, actually smiled, the dark, bitter smile of one who is without hope. But at the same time his action belied his words, for his hands instinctively sought the hilt of the great kukri knife and rested there. "'When does the next train start for Galatz?' said Van Helsing to us generally. "'At six-thirty tomorrow morning we all started, for the answer came from Mrs. Harker. "'How on earth do you know?' said Art. "'You forget, or perhaps you do not know, though Jonathan does, and so does Dr. Van Helsing, that I am the train fiend. At home in Exeter I always used to make up the timetable so as to be helpful to my husband.' "'I found it so useful sometimes that I always make a study of the timetables now. "'I knew that if anything were to take us to Castle Dracula, "'we should go by Galatz, or at any rate through Bucharest, "'so I learned the times very carefully. "'Unhappily, there are not many to learn, "'as the only train to-morrow leaves as I say.' "'Wonderful woman,' murmured the professor. "'Can't we get a special?' asked Lord Godalming. "'Van Helsing shook his head. "'I fear not.' This land is very different from yours or mine. Even if we did have a special, it would probably not arrive as soon as our regular train. Moreover, we have something to prepare. We must think. Now let us organize. You, friend Arthur, go to the train and get the tickets and arrange that all be ready for us to go in the morning. Do you, friend Jonathan, go to the agent of the ship and get from him letters to the agent and Galatz with authority to make a search of the ship just as it was here. Quincy Morris, you see the vice consul and get his aid with his fellow in Galatz and all he can do to make our way smooth so that no times be lost when over the Danube. John will stay with Madame Mina and me, and we shall consult. For so, if time be long, you may be delayed, and it will not matter when the sun sets since I am here with Madame to make report. And I, said Mrs. Harker brightly, and more like her old self than she had been for many a long day, shall try to be of use in all ways, and shall think and write for you as I used to do. Something is shifting from me in some strange way, and I feel freer than I have been of late. The three younger men looked happier at the moment, as they seemed to realize the significance of her words. But Van Helsing and I, turning to each other, met each a grave and troubled glance. We said nothing at the time, however. When the three men had gone out to their tasks, Van Helsing asked Mrs. Harker to look up the copy of the diaries and find him the part of Harker's journal at the castle. She went away to get it. When the door was shut upon her, he said to me, "'We mean the same. Speak out.' "'Here is some change. It is a hope that makes me sick, for it may deceive us.' "'Quite so. Do you know why I asked her to get the manuscript?' "'No,' said I, "'unless it was to get an opportunity of seeing me alone.' "'You are in part right, friend John, but only in part. "'I want to tell you something. Do. "'My friend, I am taking a great, a terrible risk. "'But I believe it is right. "'In the moment when Madamina said those words "'that arrest both our understanding, "'an inspiration came to me. "'In the trance of three days ago, "'the Count sent her his spirit to read her mind, "'or, more like, he took her to see him "'in his earth box in the ship, with water rushing, just as it go free at rise and set of sun. He learned then that we are here, for she have more to tell in her open life with eyes to see ears to hear than he, shut as he is in his coffin box. Now he makes his most important effort to escape us. At present he want her not. He is sure with his so great knowledge that she will come at his call, but he cut her off. "'Take her as he can do out of his own power, "'that so she come not to him. "'Ah, there I have hope that our man-brains "'that have been of man so long "'and that have not lost the grace of God "'will come higher than his child-brain "'that lie in his tomb for centuries, "'that grow not yet to our stature, "'and that do only work selfish and therefore small. 
Here come Madam Mina, not word to her of her trance. She knows it not, and it would overwhelm her and make despair just when we want all her hope, all her courage, when most we want all her great brain, which is trained like man's brain, but is of sweet woman, and have a special power which the Count give her, and which he may not take away altogether, though he think not so. Hush! Let me speak, and you shall learn. Oh, John, my friend, we are in awful straits. I fear as I never feared before. We can only trust the good God. Silence! Here she comes. I thought that the professor was going to break down and have hysterics, just as he had when Lucy died. But with a great effort he controlled himself, and was a perfect nervous poise when Mrs. Harker tripped into the room, bright and happy-looking, and in the doing of work, seemingly forgetful of her misery. As she came in, she handed a number of sheets of typewriting to Van Helsing. He looked over them gravely, his face brightening up as he read. Then, holding the pages between his finger and thumb, he said, "'Friend John, to you with so much experience already, and you too, dear Madam Mina, that are young, here is a lesson. Do not fear ever to think. A half-thought has been buzzing often in my brain, but I fear to let him lose his wings.' Here, now, with more knowledge, I go back to where that half-thought comes from, and I find that he be no half-thought at all, that be a whole thought, though so young that he is not yet strong to use his little wings. Nay, like the ugly duck of my friend Hans Andersen, he be no duck-thought at all, but a big swan-thought that sail nobly on big wings when the time come for him to try them. See, I read here what Jonathan have written." that other of his race, who in a later age again and again brought his forces over the great river into Turkey land, who when he was beaten back came again, and again and again, though he had to come alone from the bloody field where his troops were being slaughtered, since he knew that he alone could ultimately triumph. What does this tell us? Not much, no? The Count's child thought see nothing, therefore he speaks so free. Your man thought see nothing." My man thought see nothing till just now. No. But there comes another word from someone who speak without thought because she too know not what it mean, what it might mean. Just as there are elements which rest, yet when in nature's course they move on their way and they touch, the poof, and here comes flash of light heaven-wide that blind and kill and destroy some. But that show up all earth below for leagues and leagues. Is it not so? Well, I shall explain. To begin... Have you ever studied the philosophy of crime? Yes and no. You, John, yes, for it is a study of insanity. You, no, Madam Mina, for crime touch you not, not but once. Still, your mind works true, and argues not a particularly ad universale. There is this peculiarity in criminals. It is so constant in all countries and at all times that even police, who know not much from philosophy, come to know it empirically that it is. That is to be empiric. The criminal always work at one crime. That is the true criminal who seems predestined to crime and who will of none other. This criminal has not full man brain. He is clever and cunning and resourceful, but he be not of man's stature as to brain. He be of child brain in much. Now, this criminal of ours is predestinate to crime also. He too have child brain and it is of the child to do what he have done. The little bird, the little fish, the little animal, learn not by principle, but empirically. And when he learn to do, then there is to him the ground to start from to do more. Tos pusto, said Archimedes. Give me a fulcrum, and I shall move the world. To do once is the fulcrum whereby child brain become man brain and until he have the purpose to do more, he continue to do the same again every time, just as he have done before. Oh, my dear, I see that your eyes are opened, and that to you the lightning flash show all the leagues. For Mrs. Harker began to clasp her hand, and her eyes sparkled. He went on, Now you shall speak. Tell us two dry men of science what you see with those so bright eyes. He took her hand and held it whilst he spoke. His finger and thumb closed on her pulse, as I thought instinctively and unconsciously as she spoke. The Count is a criminal, and of criminal type. Nordau and Lombroso would so classify him, and qua criminale, he is of an imperfectly formed mind. Thus, in a difficulty, he has to seek resource and habit. 
His past is a clue, and the one page of it that we know, and that from his own lips, tells that once before, when in what Mr. Morris would call a tight place, he went back to his own country from the land he had tried to invade, and thence, without losing purpose, prepared himself for a new effort. He came again, better equipped for his work, and won. So he came to London to invade a new land. He was beaten, and when all hope of success was lost and his existence in danger, he fled back over the sea to his home, just as formerly he had fled back over the Danube from Turkey land. Good, good, och, you so clever lady, said Van Helsing enthusiastically as he stooped and kissed her hand. A moment later he said to me, as calmly as though we had been having a sick room consultation, Seventy-two only, and in all this excitement I have hope. Turning to her again, he said with keen expectation, But go on, go on. There is more to tell, if you will. Be not afraid. John and I know. I do in any case, and shall tell you if you are right. Speak without fear. I will try to, but you will forgive me if I seem too egotistical. Nay, fear not. You must be egotist, for it is of you that they think. Then, as he is criminal, he is selfish, and as his intellect is small and his action is based on selfishness, he confines himself to one purpose. That purpose is remorseless. As he fled back over the Danube, leaving his forces to be cut to pieces, so now he is intent on being safe, careless of all. So his own selfishness frees my soul somewhat from the terrible power which he acquired over me on that dreadful night. I felt it. Oh, I felt it. Thank God for his great mercy. My soul is freer than it has been since that awful hour, and all that haunts me is a fear lest in some trance or dream he may have used my knowledge for his ends. The professor stood up. He has so used your mind, and by it he has left us here in Varna, whilst the ship that carried him rushed through the enveloping fog up to Golanz, where doubtless he had made preparation for escaping from us. But his child mind only saw so far. "'and it may be that, as ever is in God's providence, "'the very thing that the evildoer must reckon on for his selfish good "'turns out to be his chiefest harm. "'The hunter is taken in his own snare, as the great psalmist says, "'for now that he think he is free from every trace of us all "'and that he has escaped us with so many hours to him, "'then his selfish child brain will whisper him to sleep. "'He think, too, that as he cut himself off from knowing your mind, "'there can be no knowledge of him to you.' There is where he fail. That terrible baptism of blood which he give you makes you free to go to him in spirit, as you have as yet done in your times of freedom when the sun rise and set. At such times you go by my volition and not by his, and this power to good of you and others you have won from your suffering at his hands. This is now all more precious that he know it not, and to God himself have even cut himself off from his knowledge of our wear. We, however, are not selfish, and we believe that God is with us through all this blackness and these many dark hours. We shall follow him, and we shall not flinch, even if we peril ourselves that we become like him. Friend John, this has been a great hour, and it have done much to advance us on our way. You must be scribe and write him all down, so that when the others return from their work, you can give it to them, and they shall know as we do. And so I have written it whilst we wait for their return. And Mrs. Harker has written with a typewriter all since she brought the manuscript to us. The End of Chapter 25 Dracula by Brom Stoker Chapter 26 Dr. Seward's Diary 29 October This is written in the train from Varna to Galatz. Last night we all assembled a little before the time of sunset. Each of us had done his work as well as he could, so far as thought, and endeavor, and opportunity go, we are prepared for the whole of our journey, and for our work when we get to Galatz. When the usual time came round, Mrs. Harker prepared herself for her hypnotic effort, and after a longer and more serious effort on the part of Van Helsing than has been usually necessary, she sank into the trance. Usually she speaks on a hint— but this time the professor had to ask her questions, and to ask them pretty resolutely before we could learn anything. At last her answer came. I can see nothing. We are still. There are no waves lapping, but only a steady swirl of water softly running against the hawser. I can hear the men's voices calling near and far, and the roll and creak of oars in the rowlocks. 
A gun is fired somewhere. The echo of it seems far away. There's tramping of feet overhead, and ropes and chains are dragged along. What is this? There is a gleam of light. I can feel the air blowing upon me. Here she stopped. She had risen, as if impulsively, from where she lay on the sofa, and raised both her hands, palms upwards, as if lifting a weight. Van Helsing and I looked at each other with understanding. Quincy raised his eyebrows slightly, and looked at her intently, whilst Harker's hand instinctively closed around the hilt of his cookery. There was a long pause. We all knew that the time when she could speak was passing, but we felt that it was useless to say anything. Suddenly she sat up, and as she opened her eyes said sweetly, "'Would none of you like a cup of tea? You must all be so tired.' We could only make her happy, and so acquiesced. She bustled off to get tea. When she had gone, Van Helsing said, "'You see, my friends, he is close to land. He has left his earth chest, but he has yet to get on shore. In the night he may lie hidden somewhere, but if he be not carried on shore, or if the ship do not touch it, he cannot achieve the land. In such case he can, if it be in the night, change his form, and jump or fly on shore, then, unless he be carried, he cannot escape.' And if he be carried, then the customs men may discover what the box contain. Thus, in fine, if he escape not on shore tonight or before dawn, there will be the whole day lost to him. We may then arrive in time, for if he escape not at night, we shall come on him in daytime, boxed up and at our mercy, for he dare not be his true self, awake and visible, lest he be discovered. There was no more to be said. "'so we waited in patience until the dawn, "'at which time we might learn more from Mrs. Harker. "'Early this morning we listened with breathless anxiety "'for her response in her trance. "'The hypnotic stage was even longer in coming than before, "'and when it came the time remaining until full sunrise "'was so short that we began to despair. "'Van Helsing seemed to throw his whole soul into the effort. "'At last, in obedience to his will, she made reply. "'All is dark.' I hear lapping water, level with me, and some creaking as of wood on wood. She paused, and the red sun shot up. We must wait till tonight. And so it is that we are travelling towards Galatz in an agony of expectation. We are due to arrive between two and three in the morning, but already at Bucharest we are three hours late, so we possibly cannot get in till well after sun-up. Thus we shall have two more hypnotic messages from Mrs. Harker. "'Either or both may possibly throw more light on what is happening. "'Later. "'Sunset has come and gone. "'Fortunately, it came at a time when there was no distraction, "'for had it occurred whilst we were at a station, "'we might not have secured the necessary calm and isolation. "'Mrs. Harker yielded to the hypnotic influence "'even less readily than this morning. "'I am in fear that her power of reading the Count's sensations "'may die away just when we want it most.' "'It seems to me that her imagination is beginning to work. "'Whilst she has been in the trance hitherto, "'she has confined herself to the simplest of facts. "'If this goes on, it may ultimately mislead us. "'If I thought that the Count's power over her "'would die away equally with her power of knowledge, "'it would be a happy thought. "'But I am afraid that it may not be so. "'When she did speak, her words were enigmatical. "'Something is going out. "'I can feel it pass me like a cold wind.' I can hear far-off, confused sounds, as of men talking in strange tongues, fierce falling water, and the howling of wolves. She stopped, and a shudder ran through her, increasing in intensity for a few seconds, till at the end she shook as though in a palsy. She said no more, even in answer to the professor's imperative questioning. When she woke from the trance she was cold and exhausted and languid, but her mind was all alert. She could not remember anything, but asked what she had said. When she was told, she pondered over it deeply for a long time and in silence. 30 October, 7 a.m. We are near Galatz now, and I may not have time to write later. Sunrise this morning was anxiously looked for by us all, knowing of the increasing difficulty of procuring the hypnotic trance, Van Helsing began his passes earlier than usual. They produced no effect, however, until the regular time when she yielded with a still greater difficulty only a minute before the sun rose. The professor lost no time in his questioning. Her answer came with equal quickness. All is dark. I hear water swelling by, level with my ears, 
and the creaking of wood on wood. Cattle low far off. There is another sound, a queer one, like... She stopped and grew white and whiter still. Go on, go on, speak, I command you, said Van Helsing in an agonized voice. At the same time there was despair in his eyes, for the risen sun was reddening even Mrs. Harker's pale face. She opened her eyes, and we all started as she said, sweetly and seemingly with the utmost unconcern. "'Oh, Professor, why ask me to do what you know I can't? I don't remember anything.' Then, seeing the look of amazement on our faces, she said, turning from one to the other with a troubled look, "'What have I said? What have I done?' "'I know nothing, only that I was lying here half asleep "'and heard you say, "'Go on, speak, I command you. "'It seemed so funny to hear you order me about "'as if I were a bad child. "'Och, Madame Mina,' he said sadly, "'it is proof, if proof be needed, "'of how I love and honour you "'when a word for your good, "'spoken more earnest than ever, "'can seem so strange, "'because it is to order her whom I am proud to obey.' "'The whistles are sounding.' We are nearing Galatz. We are on fire with anxiety and eagerness. Mina Harker's Journal 30 October Mr. Morris took me to the hotel where our rooms had been ordered by telegraph, he being the one who could best be spared since he does not speak any foreign language. The forces were distributed much as they had been at Varna, except that Lord Godalming went to the vice-consul, as his rank might serve as an immediate guarantee of some sort to the official, we being in extreme hurry. Jonathan and the two doctors went to the shipping agent to learn particulars of the arrival of the Tsarina Catherine. Later. Lord Godalming has returned. The consul is away, and the vice-consul sick, so the routine work has been attended to by a clerk. He was very obliging and offered to do anything in his power. Jonathan Harker's Journal, 30 October. At nine o'clock... Dr. Van Helsing, Dr. Seward, and I called on Messrs. Mackenzie and Steinkoff, the agents of the London firm of Hapgood. They had received a wire from London in answer to Lord Godalming's telegraphed request, asking them to show us any civility in their power. They were more than kind and courteous, and took us at once on board the Tsarina Catherine, which lay anchor out in the river harbour. There we saw the captain, Donaldson by name, who told us of his voyage. He said that in all his life he had never had so favourable a run." Man, he said, but it made us afeard, for we expect it that we should have to pay for it with some rare piece of ill luck so as to keep up the average. It's no canny to run frae London to the Black Sea where a wind a hint you as though the dell himself were a blown on your sail for his ain purpose. And a the time we could no spare a thing. Gin we were nigh a ship or a port or a headland, a fog fell on us and travelled with us till when after it had lifted and we looked out, the dell a thing could we see. We ran by Gibraltar without being able to signal. Until we came to the Dardanelles and had to wait to get our permit to pass, we were never within a hell of a aught. At first I inclined to slack off sail and beat about till the fog was lifted. But whilst I thought that if the devil was minded to get us into the Black Sea quick, he was like to do it whether we would or no. If we had a quick voyage, it would be no to our miscredit with the owners, or no hurt to our traffic, and the old man who had served his own purpose would be decently grateful to us for no hindering them. This mixture of simplicity and cunning, of superstition and commercial reasoning, aroused Van Helsing, who said, "'My dear friend, the devil is more clever than he is thought by some, and he know when he meet his match.' The skipper was not displeased with the compliment, and went on. "'When we got past the Bosphorus, the men began to grumble. Some of them, the Romanians, came and asked me to heave overboard a big box which had been put on board by a queer-looking old man just before we had started for London.' I'd seen them spear at the fellow and put out their twa fingers when they saw him to guard against the evil eye. Man, but the superstition of falls is perfectly ridiculous. I sent them about their business pretty quick, but soon after a fall closed in on us, I fell weep bit as they did and then something, though I wouldn't say it was again the big box. Well, on we went, and as the fog didn't let up for five days, I just let the wind carry us, for if the devil wanted us to get somewhere as well, he would fetch it up a reet, and if he didn't, well... We'd keep a sharp lookout anyhow. Sure enough, we had a fair way in deep water all the time, and two days ago, when the morning sun came through the fog, we found ourselves just in the river opposite Galatz. The Romanians were wild and wanted me, right or wrong, to take out the box and fling it in the river. I had to argue with him about it with a handspike, 
and when the last of them rose off the deck with his head in his hand, I had convinced him that evil eye or no evil eye, the property and the trust of my owners were better in my hands than in the river, Danube. They had mind you taken the box on the deck ready to fling in, and as it was marked Galatz by Varna, I thought I'd let it lie till we discharged in the port and get rid of it altogether. We didn't do much of clearing that day and had to remain that night to Danker, but in the morning, brought and early, an hour before sunup, a man come aboard with a order written to him from England to receive a box marked for one Count Dracula. Sure knock, the matter was one ready to his end. He had his papers a writ, and glad I was to get rid of the damn thing, for I was beginning myself to feel uneasy at it. If the devil did have any luggage aboard the ship, I'm a-thinking it was none other than that same. "'What was the name of the man who took it?' asked Dr. Van Helsing with restrained eagerness. "'I'll be telling you quick,' he answered, and stepping down to his cabin, produced a receipt sign. "'Emanuel Hildesheim. Bergenstorff 16 was the address. We found out that this was all the captain knew. So with thanks we came away.' We found Hildesheim in his office, a Hebrew of rather the Adelphi theatre type, with a nose like a sheep and a fez. His arguments were pointed with specie, we doing the punctuation, and with a little bargaining he told us what he knew. This turned out to be simple, but important. He had received a letter from Monsieur de Ville of London, telling him to receive, if possible, before sunrise, so as to avoid customs, a box which would arrive at Galatz in the Tsarina Catherine. This he was to give in charge to a certain Petrov Skinsky, who dealt with the Slovaks who traded down the river to the port. He had been paid for his work by an English banknote, which had been duly cashed for gold at the Danube International Bank. When Skinsky had come to him, he had taken him to the ship and handed over the box, so as to save porterage. That was all he knew. We then sought for Skinsky, but were unable to find him. One of his neighbors, who did not seem to bear him any affection, said that he had gone away two days before, no one knew whither. This was corroborated by his landlord, who had received by messenger the key of the house altogether with the rent to do in English money. This had been between ten and eleven o'clock last night. We were at a standstill again. Whilst we were talking, one came running and breathlessly gasped out that the body of Skinsky had been found inside the wall of the churchyard of St. Peter, and that the throat had been torn open as if by some wild animal. Those we had been speaking with ran off to see the horror, the women crying out, "'This is the work of a Slovak!' We hurried away, lest we should have been in some way drawn into the affair and so detained. As we came home, we could arrive at no definite conclusion. We were all convinced that the box was on its way by water to somewhere— but where that might be we would have to discover. With heavy hearts we came home to the hotel to Mina. When we met together, the first thing was to consult as to taking Mina again into our confidence. Things are getting desperate, and it is at least a chance, though a hazardous one. As a preliminary step, I was released from my promise to her. Mina Harker's Journal, 30 October, Evening they were so tired and worn out and dispirited that there was nothing to be done till they had some rest. So I asked them all to lie down for half an hour whilst I should enter everything up to the moment. I feel so grateful to the man who invented the traveller's typewriter and to Mr. Morris for getting this one for me. I should have felt quite astray doing the work if I had to write with a pen. It is all done. Poor, dear, dear Jonathan, what he must have suffered, what he must be suffering now— he lies on the sofa, hardly seeming to breathe, and his whole body appears in collapse. His brows are knit. His face is drawn with pain. Poor fellow! Maybe he is thinking, and I can see his face all wrinkled up with the concentration of his thoughts. Oh! If I could only help at all, I shall do what I can. I have asked Dr. Van Helsing, and he has got me all the papers that I have not yet seen. Whilst they are resting, I shall go over all carefully, and perhaps I may arrive at some conclusion— I shall try to follow the professor's example and think without prejudice on the facts before me. I do believe that under God's providence I have made a discovery. I shall get the maps and look over them. I am more than ever sure that I am right. My new conclusion is ready, so I shall get our party together and read it. They can judge it. It is well to be accurate, and every minute is precious. Mina Harker's Memorandum Entered in her journal Ground of Inquiry Count Dracula's problem is to get back to his own place. A. He must be brought back by someone. This is evident, for had he power to move himself as he wished, he could go either as man or wolf or bat or in some other way. 
he evidently fears discovery or interference in the state of helplessness in which he must be, confined as he is between dawn and sunset in his wooden box. B. How is he to be taken? Here a process of exclusions may help us. By road? By rail? By water? 1. By road. There are endless difficulties, especially in leaving the city. X. There are people, and people are curious and investigate. A hint, a surmise, a doubt as to what might be in the box would destroy him. Why? There are, or there may be, customs and octroi officers to pass. Z. His pursuers might follow. This is his highest fear, and in order to prevent his being betrayed, he has repelled, so far as he can, even his victim, me. 2. By rail. There is no one in charge of the box. It would have to take its chance of being delayed, and delay would be fatal with enemies on the track. True, he might escape at night. But what would he be if left in a strange place with no refuge that he could fly to? This is not what he intends, and he does not mean to risk it. 3. By water. Here is the safest way, in one respect, but with most danger in another. On the water he is powerless except at night. Even then he can only summon fog and storm and snow and his wolves, but were he wrecked, the living water would engulf him, helpless, and he would indeed be lost. He could have the vessel drive to land, but if it were unfriendly land wherein he was not free to move, his position would still be desperate. We know from the record that he was on the water, so what we have to do is ascertain what water. The first thing is to realize exactly what he has done as yet. We may then get a light on what his task is to be. Firstly, we must differentiate between what he did in London as part of his general plan of action when he was pressed for moments and had to arrange as best he could. Secondly, we must see, as well as we can surmise it from the facts we know of, what he has done here. As to the first, he evidently intended to arrive at Galantz and sent invoice to Varnard to deceive us lest we should ascertain his means of exit from England. His immediate and sole purpose then was to escape. The proof of this is the letter of instruction sent to Emanuel Hildesheim to clear and take away the box before sunrise. There is also the instruction to Petrov Skinsky. These we must only guess at, but there must have been some letter or message since Skinsky came to Hildesheim. That, so far, his plans were successful, we know. The Tsarina Catherine made a phenomenally quick journey, so much so that Captain Donaldson's suspicions were aroused. But his superstition, united with his canniness, played the Count's game for him, and he ran with his favouring wind through fogs and all till he brought up blindfold at Galatz. That the Count's arrangements were well made has been proved. Hildesheim cleared the box, took it off, and gave it to Skinsky. Skinsky took it, and here we lose the trail. We only know that the box is somewhere on the water moving along. The customs and the octroi, if there be any, have been avoided. Now we come to what the Count must have done after his arrival on land at Galatz. The box was given to Skinsky before sunrise. At sunrise the Count could appear in his own form. Here we ask why Skinsky was chosen at all to aid in the work. In my husband's diary, Skinsky is mentioned as dealing with the Slovaks who trade down the river to the port, and the man's remark that the murder was the work of a Slovak showed the general feeling against his class. The Count wanted isolation. My surmise is this, that in London the Count decided to get back to his castle by water as the most safe and secret way. He was brought from the castle by Zgani, and probably they delivered their cargo to Slovaks, who took the boxes to Varna, for there they were shipped to London. Thus the Count had knowledge of the persons who could arrange this service. When the box was on land, before sunrise or after sunset, he came out from his box met Skinsky, and instructed him what to do as to arranging the carriage of the box up some river. When this was done, and he knew that all was in train, he blotted out his traces, as he thought, by murdering his agent. I have examined the map, and find that the river most suitable for the Slovaks to have ascended is either the Pruth or the Sarath. I read in the typescript that in my trance I heard cows low, and water swirling level with my ears and the creaking of wood. The Count in his box, then, was on a river in an open boat, propelled probably either by oars or poles, for the banks are near, and it is working against stream. There would be no such if floating downstream. Of course, it may not be either the Sarath or the Proof, but we may possibly investigate further. 
Now of these two, the Pruth is the more easily navigated, but the Sareth is at Fundu, joined by the Bistritza, which runs up around the Borgo Pass. The loop it makes is manifestly as close to Dracula's castle as can be got by water. Mina Harker's Journal Continued When I had done reading, Jonathan took me in his arms and kissed me. The others kept shaking me by both hands, and Dr. Van Helsing said, "'Our dear Madam Mina is once more our teacher. Her eyes have been where we were blinded. Now we are on the track once again, and this time we may succeed. Our enemy is at his most helpless, and if we can come on him by day on the water, our task will be over. He has a start, but he is powerless to hasten, as he may not leave this box, lest those who carry him may suspect. For them to suspect would be to prompt them to throw him in the stream where he perish. This he knows, and will not. Now, men, to our council of war, for here and now we must plan what each and all shall do. I shall get a steam launch and follow him, said Lord Godalming. And I horses to follow on the bank, lest by chance he land, said Mr. Morris. Good, said the professor, both good, but neither must go alone. There must be force to overcome force if need be. The Slovak is strong and rough, and he carries rude arms. All the men smiled, for amongst them they carried a small arsenal. Said Mr. Morris, I brought some Winchesters. They are pretty handy in a crowd, and there may be wolves. The Count, if you remember, took some other precautions. He made some requisitions on others that Mrs. Harker could not quite hear or understand. We must be ready at all points. Dr. Seward said, I think I had better go with Quincy. We have been accustomed to hunt together, and we two, well armed, will be a match for whatever may come along. You must not be alone, Art. It may be necessary to fight the Slovaks, and a chance thrust, for I don't suppose these fellows carry guns, would undo all our plans. There must be no chances this time. We shall not rest until the Count's head and body have been separated, and we are sure that he cannot reincarnate. He looked at Jonathan as he spoke, and Jonathan looked at me. I could see that the poor dear was torn about in his mind. Of course he wanted to be with me, but then the boat service would most likely be the one which would destroy the... the... vampire. Why did I hesitate to write the word? He was silent a while, and during his silence Dr. Van Helsing spoke. Friend Jonathan, this is to you for twice reasons. First, because you are young and brave and can fight, and all energies may be needed at the last. And again, that it is your right to destroy him. That which has wrought such woe to you and yours. Be not afraid for Madame Mina. She will be in my care, if I may. I am old. My legs are not so quick to run as once, and I am not used to ride so long or to pursue as need be or to fight with lethal weapons. But I can be of other service. I can fight in other way, and I can die if need be as well as younger men. Now let me say that what I would is this. While you, my Lord Godalming, and friend Jonathan go in your so swift little steamboat up the river, and whilst John and Quincy guard the bank where perchance he might be landed, I will take Madame Mina right into the heart of the enemy's country. Whilst the old fox is tied in his box, floating on the running stream whence he cannot escape to land, where he dares not raise the lid of his coffin box, lest his slow vock carrier should in fear leave him to perish, we shall go in the track where Jonathan went, from Bistritz over the Borgo, and find our way to the castle of Dracula. Here, Madame Mina's hypnotic power will surely help, and we shall find our way all dark and unknown otherwise, after the first sunrise when we are near that fateful place. There is much to be done, and other places to be made sanctify, so that nest of vipers be obliterated. Here Jonathan interrupted him hotly. Do you mean to say, Professor Van Helsing, that you would bring Mina, in her sad case and tainted as she is with that devil's illness, right into the jaws of his death-trap? Not for the world. Not for heaven or hell. He became speechless almost for a minute, and then went on. Do you know what the place is? Have you seen that awful den of hellish infamy, with the very moonlight alive with grisly shapes, and every speck of dust that whirls in the wind, a devouring monster in embryo? Have you felt the vampire's lips upon your throat? Here he turned to me, and as his eyes lit on my forehead, he threw up his arms with a cry. Oh, my God, what have we done to have this terror upon us? And he sank down on the sofa in a collapse of misery. 
The professor's voice, as he spoke in clear, sweet tones, which seemed to vibrate in the air, calmed us all. Oh, my friend, it is because I would save Madame Mina from that awful place that I would go. God forbid that I should take her into that place. There is work, wild work, to be done before that place can be purified. Remember that we are in terrible straits. If the Count escape us this time, and he is strong and subtle and cunning, he may choose to sleep him for a century, and then in time, our dear one, he took my hand, would come to him to keep him company, and would be as those others that you, Jonathan, saw. You have told us of their gloating lips. You heard their ribald laugh as they clutched the moving bag that the Count threw to them. You shudder, and well may be. Forgive me that I make you so much pain, but it is necessary. My friend, is it not a dire need for that which I am giving possibly my life? If it were that any one went into that place to stay, it is I who would have to go to keep them company. Do as you will, said Jonathan, with a sob that shook him all over. We are in the hands of God. Later. Oh, it did me good to see the way that these brave men worked. How can women help loving men when they are so earnest and so true and so brave? And, too, it made me think of that wonderful power of money. What can it not do when basely used? I felt so thankful that Lord Godalming is rich and that both he and Mr. Morris, who also has plenty of money, are willing to spend it so freely. For if they did not, our little expedition could not start either so promptly or so well equipped as it will within another hour. It is not... Three hours since it was arranged what part each of us was to do. And now Lord Godalming and Jonathan have a lovely steam launch with steam up ready to start at a moment's notice. Dr. Seward and Mr. Morris have half a dozen good horses well appointed. We have all the maps and appliances of various kinds that can be had. Professor Van Helsing and I are to leave by the 11.40 train tonight for Varesti, where we are to get a carriage to drive to the Borgo Pass. We are bringing a good deal of ready money as we are to buy a carriage and horses. We shall drive ourselves, for we have no one whom we can trust in the matter. The professor knows something of a great many languages, so we shall get on all right. We have all got arms, even for me a large bore revolver. Jonathan would not be happy unless I was armed like the rest. Alas, I cannot carry one arm that the rest do. The scar on my forehead forbids that. Dr. Van Helsing comforts me by telling me that I am fully armed as there may be wolves. The weather is getting colder every hour, and there are snow flurries which come and go as warnings. Later. It took all my courage to say good-bye to my darling. We may never meet again. Courage, Mina. The professor is looking at you keenly. His look is a warning. There must be no tears now unless it may be that God will let them fall in gladness. Jonathan Harker's Journal 30 October, night. I am writing this in the light from the furnace door of the steam launch. Lord Godalming is firing up. He is an experienced hand at the work, as he had for years a launch of his own on the Thames and another on the Norfolk Broads. Regarding our plans, we finally decided that Mina's guess was correct, and that if any waterway was chosen for the Count's escape back to his castle, the Sarath and then the Bistritza at its junction would be the one. We took it that somewhere about the 47th degree north latitude would be the place chosen for crossing the country between the river and the Carpathians. We have no fear in running at good speed up the river at night. There's plenty of water, and the banks are wide enough apart to make steaming, even in the dark, easy enough. Lord Godalming tells me to sleep for a while, as it is enough for the present for one to be on watch. But I cannot sleep. How can I, with the terrible danger hanging over my darling, and are going out into that awful place— my only comfort is that we are in the hands of God. Only for that faith it would be easier to die than to live, and so be quit of all the trouble. Mr. Morris and Dr. Seward were off on their long ride before we started. They ought to keep up the right bank far enough off to get on higher lands where they can see a good stretch of river and avoid the following of its curves. They have for the first stages two men to ride and lead their spare horses, four and all, so as not to excite curiosity. When they dismiss the men, which shall be shortly, they shall themselves look after the horses. It may be necessary for us to join forces. If so, they can mount our whole party. One of the saddles has a movable horn, and can be easily adapted for Mina if required. It is a wild adventure we are on. 
Here, as we are rushing along through the darkness, with the cold from the river seeming to rise up and strike at us, with all the mysterious voices of the night around us, it all comes home. We seem to be drifting into unknown places and unknown ways, into a whole world of dark and dreadful things. Kuldalming is shutting the furnace door. 31 October Still hurrying along. The day has come and Godalming is sleeping. I am on watch. The morning is bitterly cold. The furnace heat is grateful, though we have heavy fur coats. As yet we have passed only a few open boats, but none of them had on board any box or package of anything like the size of the one we seek. The men were scared every time we turned our electric lamp on them and fell on their knees and prayed. 1 November. Evening. No news all day. We have found nothing of the kind we seek. We have now passed into the Bistritza, and if we are wrong in our surmise, our chance is gone. We have overhauled every boat, big and little. Early this morning, one crew took us for a government boat and treated us accordingly. We saw in this a way of smoothing matters, so at Fundu, where the Bistritza runs into the Sarath, we got a Romanian flag, which we now fly conspicuously. With every boat which we have overhauled since then, this trick has succeeded. We have had every deference shown to us, and not once any objection to whatever we chose to ask or do. Some of the Slovaks tell us that a big boat passed them, going at more than usual speed, as she had a double crew on board. This was before they came to Fundu, so they could not tell us whether the boat turned into the Bistritza or continued up the Sarath. At Fundu we could not hear of any such boat, so she must have passed there in the night. I am feeling very sleepy. The cold is perhaps beginning to tell upon me, and nature must have rest some time. Godalming insists that he shall keep the first watch. God bless him for all his goodness to poor dear Mina and me. 2 November. Morning. It is broad daylight. That good fellow would not wake me. He says it would have been a sin to, for I slept peacefully and was forgetting my trouble. It seems brutally selfish to me to have slept so long and let him watch all night, but he was quite right. I am a new man this morning, and as I sit here and watch him sleeping, I can do all that is necessary both as to minding the engine, steering, and keeping watch. I can feel that my strength and energy are coming back to me. I wonder where Mina is now, and Van Helsing. They should have got to Varesti about noon on Wednesday. It would take them some time to get the carriage and horses, so if they had started and travelled hard, they would be now about at the Borgo Pass. God guide and help them. I am afraid to think what may happen if we could only go faster, but we cannot. The engines are throbbing and doing their utmost. I wonder how Dr. Seward and Mr. Morris are getting on. There seem to be endless streams running down the mountains into this river, but as none of them are very large at present, at all events, though they are doubtless terrible in winter and when the snow melts, the horsemen may not have met such obstruction. I hope that before we get to Strasbourg we may see them, for if by that time we have not overtaken the Count— it may be necessary to take counsel together what to do next. Dr. Seward's Diary, 2 November. Three days on the road. No news, and no time to write it if there had been, for every moment is precious. We have had only the rest needful for the horses, but we are both bearing it wonderfully. Those adventurous days of ours are turning up useful. We must push on. We shall never feel happy till we get the launch in sight again. 3 November. We heard at Fundu that the launch had gone up the Bistritza. I wish it wasn't so cold. There are signs of snow coming, and if it falls heavy it will stop us. In such case we must get a sledge and go on, Russian fashion. 4 November. Today we heard of the launch having been detained by an accident when trying to force a way up the rapids. The Slovak boats get up all right by aid of a rope and steering with knowledge. Some went up only a few hours before. Godalming is an amateur fitter himself, and evidently it was he who put the launch in trim again. Finally, they got up the rapids all right with local help, and are off on the chase afresh. I fear that the boat is not any better for the accident. The peasantry tell us that after she got upon smooth water again, she kept stopping every now and again so long as she was in sight. We must push on harder than ever. Our help may be wanted soon. Mina Harker's Journal 31 October Arrived at Veresti at noon. The professor tells me that this morning at dawn he could hardly hypnotize me at all, and that all I could say was, dark and quiet. He is now off buying a carriage and horses. 
He says that he will later on try to buy additional horses so that we may be able to change them on the way. We have something more than seventy miles before us. The country is lovely and most interesting. If only we were under different conditions, how delightful it would be to see it all. If Jonathan and I were driving through it alone, what a pleasure it would be. To stop and see people and learn something of their life, and to fill our minds and memories with all the color and picturesqueness of the whole wild, beautiful country and the quaint people. But alas! Later. Dr. Van Helsing has returned. He has got the carriage and horses. We ought to have some dinner and to start in an hour. The landlady is putting us up a huge basket of provisions. It seems enough for a company of soldiers. The professor encourages her and whispers to me that it may be a week before we can get any food again. He has been shopping, too, and has sent home such a wonderful lot of fur coats and wraps and all sorts of warm things. There will not be any chance of our being cold. We shall soon be off. I am afraid to think what may happen to us. We are truly in the hands of God. He alone knows what may be, and I pray him with all the strength of my sad and humble soul that he will watch over my beloved husband, that whatever may happen, Jonathan may know that I loved him and honored him more than I can say, and that latest and truest thought will be always for him. The End of Chapter 26 Dracula by Bram Stoker Chapter 27 Mina Harker's Journal 1 November All day long we have traveled at a good speed. The horses seem to know that they are being kindly treated, for they go willingly their full stage at best speed. We have now had so many changes and find the same thing so constantly that we are encouraged to think that the journey will be an easy one. Dr. Van Helsing is laconic. He tells the farmers that he is hurrying to Bistritz and pays them well to make the exchange of horses. We get hot soup, or coffee, or tea, and off we go. It is a lovely country, full of beauties of all imaginable kinds, and the people are brave and strong and simple and seem full of nice qualities. They are very, very superstitious. In the first house where we stopped, when the woman who served us saw the scar on my forehead, she crossed herself and put out two fingers towards me to keep off the evil eye. I believe they went to the trouble of putting an extra amount of garlic into our food, and I can't abide garlic. Ever since then, I have taken care not to take off my hat or veil, and so have escaped their suspicions. We are travelling fast, and as we have no driver with us to carry tales, we go ahead of scandal. But I dare say that fear of the evil eye will follow hard behind us all the way. The professor seems tireless. All day he would not take any rest, though he made me sleep for a long spell. At sunset time he hypnotized me, and he says I answered as usual, Darkness, lapping water, and creaking wood. So our enemy is still on the river. I am afraid to think of Jonathan, but somehow I have now no fear for him or for myself. I write this whilst we wait in a farmhouse for the horses to be ready. Dr. Van Helsing is sleeping. Poor dear! He looks very tired and old and grey, but his mouth is set as firmly as a conqueror's. Even in his sleep he is intense with resolution. When we have well started, I must make him rest whilst I drive. I shall tell him that we have days before us, and he must not break down when most of all his strength will be needed. All is ready. We are off shortly. 2 November, morning. I was successful, and we took turns driving all night. Now the day is on us bright, though cold. There is a strange heaviness in the air. I say heaviness for want of a better word. I mean that it oppresses us both. It is very cold, and only our warm furs keep us comfortable. At dawn, Van Helsing hypnotized me. He says I answered, Darkness, creaking wood, and roaring water. So the river is changing as they ascend. I do hope that my darling will not run any chance of danger more than need be, but we are in God's hands. 2 November, Night all day long driving. The country gets wilder as we go, and the great spurs of the Carpathians, which at Varesti seemed so far from us and so low on the horizon, now seem to gather round us and tower in front. We both seem in good spirits. I think we make an effort each to cheer the other, in the doing so we cheer ourselves. Dr. Van Helsing says that by morning we shall reach the Borgo Pass. The houses are very few here now, and the professor says that the last horse we got will have to go on with us, as we may not be able to change. He got two in addition to the two we changed, so that now we have a rude four in hand. 
The dear horses are patient and good, and they give us no trouble. We are not worried with other travellers, and so even I can drive. We shall get to the pass in daylight. We do not want to arrive before, so we take it easy and have each a long rest in turn. Oh, what will tomorrow bring to us? We go to seek the place where my poor darling suffered so much. God grant that we may be guided aright, and that he will deign to watch over my husband and those dear to us both, and who are in such deadly peril. As for me, I am not worthy in his sight. Alas, I am unclean to his eyes, and shall be until he may deign to let me stand forth in his sight as one of those who have not incurred his wrath. Memorandum by Abraham Van Helsing 4 November This to my old and true friend John Seward, M.D. of Perfleet, London, in case I may not see him. It may explain. It is morning, and I write by a fire which all the night I have kept alive, Madam Mina aiding me. It is cold. Cold. So cold that the grey heavy sky is full of snow, which, when it falls, will settle for all winter as the ground is hardening to receive it. It seems to have affected Madam Mina. She has been so heavy of head all day that she was not like herself. She sleeps and sleeps and sleeps. She, who is usual so alert, have done literally nothing all the day. She even have lost her appetite. She make no entry into her little diary, she who writes so faithful at every pause. Something whisper to me that all is not well. However, tonight she is more whiff. A long sleep all day have refresh and restore her, for now she is all sweet and bright as ever. At sunset I try to hypnotize her, but, alas, with no effect. The power has grown less and less with each day, and tonight it fail me altogether. Well, God's will be done, whatever it may be, and whithersoever it may lead. Now to the historical, for as Madame Mina write not in her stenography, I must, in my cumbrous old fashion, that so each day of us may not go unrecorded. We got to the Borgo Pass just after sunrise yesterday morning. When I saw the signs of the dawn, I got ready for the hypnotism. We stopped our carriage and got down, so that there might be no disturbance. I made a couch with furs, and Madame Mina lying down, yield herself as usual, but more slow, and more short time than ever to the hypnotic sleep. As before came the answer, darkness and the swirling of water. Then she woke, bright and radiant, and we go on our way and soon reach the pass. At this time and place she become all on fire with zeal. Some new guiding power be in her manifested, for she point to the road and say, This is the way. How you know it? I ask. Of course I know it, she answer, and with a pause add, have not my Jonathan travelled it and wrote of his travel? At first I think somewhat strange, but soon I see that there be only one such by-road. It is used but little, and very different from the coach road from the Bukovina to Bistrich, which is more wide and hard and more of use. So we came down this road. When we meet other ways, not always very sure that there were roads at all, for they be neglect and light snow have fallen, the horses know, and they only. I give rein to them, and they go on so patient. By and by we find all the things which Jonathan have noted in that wonderful diary of him. Then we go on for long, long hours and hours. At the first I tell Madame Mina to sleep. She try, and she succeed. She sleep all the time, till at the last I feel myself too suspicious grow, and attempt to wake her. But she sleep on, and I may not wake her, though I try. I do not wish to try too hard, lest I harm her. For I know that she have suffer much, and sleep at times be all in all to her. I think I drowse myself, for all of a sudden I feel guilt, as though I have done something. I find myself bolt up, with the reins in my hand, and the good horses go along, jog, jog, as just as ever. I look down, and find Madame Mina still asleep. It is now... Not far off sunset time, and, and over the snow the light of the sun flow in big yellow flood, so that we throw great long shadow on where the mountains rise so steep, for we are going up and up, and all is, oh, so wild and rocky as though it were the end of the world. Then I arouse Madame Mina. This time 
She wake with not much trouble, and then I tried to put her to hypnotic sleep. But she slept not, being as though I were not. Still, I try and try till at once I find her and myself in dark, so I look round and find that the sun have gone down. Madame Mina laugh, and I turn and look at her. She is now quite awake, and looks so well as I never saw her since the night at Carfax when we first entered the Count's house. I am amazed and not at ease then. But she is so bright and tender and thoughtful for me that I forget all fear. I light a fire, for we have brought a supply of wood with us, and she prepare food while I undo horses and set them tethered to shelter and feed. Then, when I return to the fire, she have my supper ready. I go to help her, but she smile and tell me that she have eat already, that she was so hungry that she would not wait. I like it not, and I have grave doubts, but I fear to affright her, and so I am silent of it. She helps me, and I eat alone, and then we wrap in fur and lie beside the fire, and I tell her to sleep while I watch. But presently I forget all the watching. And when I suddenly remember that I watch, I find her lying quiet, but awake, and looking at me with so bright eyes. Once, twice more, the same occur, and I get much sleep to before morning. When I wake, I try to hypnotize her, but, alas, though she shut her eyes obedient, she may not sleep. The sun rise up and up and up, and then sleep come to her too late, but so heavy that she will not wake. I have to lift her up and place her sleeping in the carriage when I have harnessed the horses and made already. Madame still sleep, and she look in her sleep more healthy and more redder than before, and I like it not. I am afraid, afraid, afraid. I am afraid of all things, even to think, but I must go on my way. The stake we play for is life and death, or more than these, and we must not flinch. 5 November, morning. Let me be accurate in everything, for though you and I have seen some strange things together, you may think at the first that I, Van Helsing, am mad, that the many horrors and the so long strain on nerves has at the last turned my brain. All yesterday we travel, always getting closer to the mountains and moving into a more and more wild and desert land. There are great frowning precipices and but falling water, and nature seems to have held some time her carnival. Madamina still sleep, and sleep, and though I did have hunger and appeased it, I could not waken her even for food. I began to feel that the fatal spell of the place was upon her, tainted as she is with that vampire baptism. Well, said I to self, if it be that she sleep all the day, it shall also be that I do not sleep at night. As we travel on the rough road, for a road of an ancient and imperfect kind there was, I held down my head and slept. Again I waked with a sense of guilt and of time past, and found Madame Mina still sleeping and the sun low down. But all was indeed changed. The frowning mountains seemed further away, and we were near the top of a steep rising hill, on some of which was such a castle as Jonathan tell of in his diary. At once I exalted and feared, for now, for good or ill, the end was near. I woke Madame Mina and again tried to hypnotize her, but alas, unavailing till too late. Then, ere the great dark come upon us, for even after down sun the heavens reflected the gone sun on the snow, and all was for a time in a great twilight. I took out horses and fed them in what shelter I could, then I make a fire, and near it I make Madame Mina, now awake and more charming than ever, sit comfortable amid her rugs. I got ready food, but she would not eat, simply saying that she had not hunger. I did not press her, knowing her unavailingness, but I myself eat, for I must needs now be strong for all. Then, with the fear on me of what might be, I drew a ring so big for her comfort round where Madame Mina sat, and over the ring I passed some of the wafer, and I broke it fine, so that all was well guarded. She sat still all the time, so still as one dead, and she grew whiter and even whiter till the snow was not more pale, and no word she said. But when I drew near, she clung to me, and I could know that the poor soul shook her from head to feet with a tremor that was pain to feel. 
I said to her presently, when she had grown more quiet, Will you not come over to the fire? For I wished to make a test of what she could. She rose obedient, but when she had made a step she stopped and stood as one stricken. Why not go on? I asked. She shook her head, and coming back sat down in her place. Then, looking at me with open eyes as one waked from sleep, she said simply, I cannot, and remained silent. I rejoiced, for I knew that what she could not, none of those that we dreaded could. Though there might be danger to her body, yet her soul was safe. Presently the horses began to scream and tore at the tethers till I had come to them and quieted them. When they did feel my hands on them, they whinnied low as in joy and licked at my hands and were quiet for a time. Many times through the night did I come to them, till it arrived to the cold hour when all nature is at lowest, and every time my coming was with quiet of them. In the cold hour the fire began to die, and I was about stepping forth to replenish it, for now the snow came in flying sweeps and with it a chill mist. Even in the dark there was a light of some kind, as there ever is over snow, and it seemed as though the snow flurries and the wreaths of mist took shape as of women with trailing garments. All was in dead, grim silence, only that the horses whinnied and cowered as if in terror of the worst. I began to fear, horrible fears, but then came to me the sense of safety in that ring wherein I stood. I began, too, to think that my imaginings were of the night and the gloom and the unrest that I have gone through and all the terrible anxiety. It was as though my memories of old Jonathan's horrid experience were befooling me, for the snowflakes and the mist began to veil and circle round till I could get as though a shadowy glimpse of those women that would have kissed him, and then the horses cowered lower and lower and moaned in terror as men do in pain. Even the madness of fright was not to them so that they could break away. I feared for my dear Madame Mina when these weird figures drew near and circled round. I looked at her, but she sat calm and smiled at me. Then I would have stepped to the fire to replenish it. She caught me and held me back and whispered like a voice that one hears in a dream so low it was. No, no, do not go without. Here you are safe. I turned to her, and looking in her eyes, said, But you, it is for you that I fear. Thereat she laughed, a laugh low and unreal, and said, Fear for me. Why fear for me? None safer in all the world from them than I am. And as I wondered at the meaning of her words, a puff of wind made the flame leap up, and I see the red scar on her forehead. Then, alas, I knew. Did I not, I would soon have learned, for the veiling figures of mist and snow came closer, but keeping ever without the holy circle. Then they began to materialize, till, if God have not taken away my reason, for I saw through my eyes, there were before me in actual flesh the same three women that Jonathan saw in the room when they would have kissed his throat. I knew the swaying round forms, the bright hot eyes, the white teeth, the ruddy color, the voluptuous lips. They smiled ever at poor dear Madame Mina, and as their laugh came through the silence of the night, they twined their arms and pointed to her, and said in those so sweet tingling tones that Jonathan said were of the intolerable sweetness of the water glasses, Come, sister, come to us, come. In fear I turned to my poor Madame Mina, and my heart with gladness leapt like flame, for oh! The terror in her sweet eyes, the repulsion, the horror, told a story to my heart that was all of hope. God be thanked, she was not yet of them. I seized some of the firewood which was by me, and holding out some of the wafer, advanced on them towards the fire. They drew back before me, and laughed their low, horrid laugh. I fed the fire, and feared them not, for I knew that we were safe within the ring which she could not leave no more than they could enter. The horses had ceased to moan and lay still on the ground. The snow fell on them softly, and they grew whiter. I knew that there was for the poor beasts no more of terror. And so we remained till the red of the dawn began to fall to the snow gloom. I was desolate and afraid and full of woe and terror. But when that beautiful sun began to climb the horizon, life was to me again 
At the first coming of the dawn, the horrid figures melted in the whirling mist and snow. The wreaths of transparent gloom moved away towards the castle and were lost. Instinctively, with the dawn coming, I turned to Madame Minot, intending to hypnotize her. But she lay in a deep and sudden sleep from which I could not wake her. I tried to hypnotize to her sleep, but she made no response, none at all, and the day broke. I fear yet to stir. I have made my fire and have seen the horses. They are all dead. Today I have much to do here, and I keep waiting till the sun is up high, for there may be places where I must go, where that sunlight, though snow and mist obscure it, will be to me a safety. I will strengthen me with breakfast, and then I will do my terrible work. Madame Mina still sleeps, and God be thanked, she is calm in her sleep. Jonathan Harker's Journal, 4 November, Evening The accident to the launch has been a terrible thing for us. Only for it we should have overtaken the boat long ago, and by now my dear Mina would have been free. I fear to think of her, off on the wolds near that horrid place. We have got horses, and we follow on the track. I note this whilst Godalming is getting ready. We have our arms. The Scanny must look out if they mean to fight. Oh, if only Morris and Seward were with us, we must only hope. If I write no more, goodbye, Mina. God bless and keep you. Dr. Seward's Diary 5 November With the dawn, we saw the body of Zgani before us dashing away from the river with their later wagon. They surrounded it in a cluster and hurried along as though beset. The snow was falling lightly, and there is a strange excitement in the air. It may be our own feelings— but the depression is strange. Far off I hear the howling of wolves. The snow brings them down from the mountains, and there are dangers to all of us and from all sides. The horses are nearly ready, and we are soon off. We ride to death of someone. God alone knows who, or where, or what, or when, or how it may be. Dr. Van Helsing's Memorandum 5 November, Afternoon I am at least sane... Thank God for that mercy at all events, though the proving it has been dreadful. When I left Madame Mina sleeping within the holy circle, I took my way to the castle. The blacksmith hammer which I took in the carriage from Varesti was useful, though the doors were all open. I broke them off the rusty hinges, lest some ill intent or ill chance should close them, so that being entered I might not get out. Jonathan's bitter experience served me here. By memory of his diary... I found my way to the old chapel, for I knew that here my work lay. The air was oppressive. It seemed as if there was some sulphurous fume which at times made me dizzy. Either there was a roaring in my ears, or I heard afar off the howl of wolves. Then I bethought me of my dear Madamina, and I was in terrible plight. The dilemma had me between his horns. Her I had not dared to take into this place, but left safe from the vampire in that holy circle, and yet even there would be the wolf. I resolved me that my work lay here, and that as to the wolves we must submit if it were God's will. At any rate, it was only death and freedom beyond. So did I choose for her. Had it but been for myself, the choice had been easy, the maw of the wolf were better to rest in than the grave of the vampire. So I make my choice to go on with my work. I know that there were at least three graves to find, graves that are in habit. So I search, and search, and I find one of them. She lay in her vampire sleep, so full of life and voluptuous beauty, that I shudder as though I have come to do murder. Ah! I doubt not that in the old time, when such things were, many a man who set forth to do such a task as mine found at the last his heart fail him, and then his nerve, so he delay and delay and delay, till the mere beauty and the fascination of the wanton undead have hypnotized him, and he remain on and on, till sunset come, and the vampire sleep be over. Then the beautiful eyes of the fair woman open and look love, and the voluptuous mouth present to a kiss, and the man is weak. And there remain one more victim in the vampire fold, one more to swell the grim and grisly ranks of the undead. There is some fascination, surely, when I am moved by the mere presence of such an one, even lying as she lay in a tomb, fretted with age and heavy with the dust of centuries, though there be that horrid odour such as the lairs of the Count have had. 
Yes, I was moved. I, Van Helsing, with all my purpose and with my motive for hate, I was moved to a yearning for delay which seemed to paralyze my faculties and to clog my very soul. It may have been that the need of natural sleep and the strange oppression of the air were beginning to overcome me. Certainly it was that I was lapsing into sleep, the open-eyed sleep of one who yields to a sweet fascination, when there came through the snow-stilled air a long, low wail, so full of woe and pity that it woke me like the sound of a clarion, for it was the voice of my dear Madame Mina that I heard. Then I braced myself again to my horrid task, and found, by wrenching away tomb-tops, one other of the sisters, the other dark one. I dared not pause to look on her as I had on her sister, lest once more I should begin to be in thrall. But I go on searching, until presently I find in a high, great tomb, as if made to one much beloved, that other fair sister which, like Jonathan, I had seemed to gather herself out of the atoms of the mist. She was so fair to look on, so radiantly beautiful, so exquisitely voluptuous, that the very instinct of man in me, which caused some of my sex to love and to protect one of hers, made my head whirl with new emotion. But God be thanked, that soul wail of my dear Madame Mina had not died out of my ears, and before the spell could be wrought further upon me, I had nerved myself to my wild work. By this time, I had searched all the tombs in the chapel so far as I could tell, and as there had been only three of these undead phantoms around us in the night, I took it that there were no more of active undead existent. There was one great tomb, more lordly than all the rest. Huge it was, and nobly proportioned. On it was but one word. Dracula. This, then, was the undead home of the king vampire to whom so many more would do. Its emptiness spoke eloquent to make certain what I knew. Before I began to restore these women to their dead selves through my awful work, I laid in Dracula's tomb some of the wafer, and so banished him from it, undead for ever. Then began my terrible task, and I dreaded it. Had it been but one, it had been easy, comparative, but three. To begin twice more after I had been through a deed of horror, for it was terrible with the sweet Miss Lucy. But I would it not be with these strange ones who had survived through centuries and who had been strengthened by the passing of the years, who would, if they could, have fought for their foul lives. Oh, my friend John, but it was butcher work. Had I not been nerved by thoughts of other dead and of the living over whom hung such a pile of fear, I could not have gone on. I tremble, and tremble even yet, though till all was over, God be thanked my nerve did stand. Had I not seen the repose in the first place, and the gladness that stole over it just ere the final dissolution came, as realization that the soul had been won, I could not have gone further with my butchery. I could not have endured the horrid screeching as the stake drove home, the plunging of writhing form and lips of bloody foam. I should have fled in terror and left my work undone. But it is over, and the poor souls, I can pity them now and weep as I think of them placid each in her full sleep of death for a short moment ere fading. For, friend John, hardly had my knife severed the head of each, before the whole body began to melt away and crumble into its native dust, as though the death that should have come centuries ago had at last asserted itself and say at once and loud, I am here. Before I left the castle, I so fixed its entrances that never more can the Count enter there undead. Then I stepped into the circle where Madame Mina slept, she woke from her sleep, and seeing me, cried out in pain that I had endured too much. "'Come,' she said, "'come away from this awful place. Let us go to meet my husband, who is, I know, coming towards us.' She was looking thin and pale and weak, but her eyes were pure and glowed with fervour. I was glad to see her paleness and her illness, for my mind was full of the fresh horror of that ruddy vampire sleep. And so— with trust and hope, and yet full of fear, we go eastward to meet our friends, and him, whom Madame Mina tell me that she know are coming to meet us. Mina Harker's Journal 6 November It was late in the afternoon when the professor and I took our way toward the east, whence I knew Jonathan was coming. We did not go fast, 
though the way was steeply downhill, for we had to take heavy rugs and wraps with us. We dared not face the possibility of being left without warmth in the cold and the snow. We had to take some of our provisions too, for we were in a perfect desolation, and so far as we could see through the snowfall there was not even the sign of habitation. When we had gone about a mile I was tired with the heavy walking and sat down to rest. Then we looked back and saw where the clear line of Dracula's castle cut the sky, for we were so deep under the hill whereon it was set that the angle of perspective of the Carpathian mountains was far below it. We saw it in all its grandeur, perched a thousand feet on the summit of a sheer precipice, and with seemingly a great gap between it and the steep of the adjacent mountain on any side. There was something wild and uncanny about the place. We could hear the distant howling of wolves. They were far off, but the sound, even though coming muffled through the deadening snowfall, was full of terror. I knew from the way Dr. Van Helsing was searching about that he was trying to seek some strategic point where we would be less exposed in case of attack. The rough roadway still led downwards. We could trace it through the drifted snow. In a little while the professor signalled to me, so I got up and joined him. He had found a wonderful spot, a sort of natural hollow in a rock, with an entrance like a doorway between two boulders. He took me by the hand and drew me in. "'See,' he said, "'here you will be in shelter, and if the wolves do come, I can meet them one by one.' He brought in our furs and made a snug nest for me, and got out some provisions and forced them upon me. But I could not eat. To even try to do so was repulsive to me, and, much as I would have liked to please him, I could not bring myself to the attempt. He looked very sad, but did not reproach me. Taking his field glasses from the case, he stood on the top of the rock and began to search the horizon. Suddenly he called out, "'Look, Mina! Look! Look!' I sprang up and stood beside him on the rock. He handed me his glasses and pointed. The snow was now falling more heavily and swirled about fiercely, for a high wind was beginning to blow. However, there were times when there were pauses between the snow flurries, and I could see a long way round. From the height where we were it was possible to see a great distance, and far off, beyond the white waste of snow, I could see the river lying like a black ribbon in kinks and curls as it wound its way. Straight in front of us, and not far off, in fact, so near that I wondered we had not noticed before, came a group of mounted men hurrying along. In the midst of them was a cart, a long leader wagon, which swept from side to side like a dog's tail wagging, with each stern inequality of the road. Outlined against the snow as they were, I could see from the men's clothes that they were peasants or gypsies of some kind. On the cart was a great square chest. My heart leaped as I saw it, for I felt that the end was coming. The evening was now drawing close, and well I knew that at sunset the thing which was till then imprisoned there would take new freedom, and could in any of many forms elude pursuit. In fear I turned to the professor. To my consternation, however, he was not there. An instant later I saw him below me. Round the rock he had drawn a circle, such as we had found shelter in last night. When he had completed it, he stood beside me again, saying, "'At least you shall be safe here from him.' He took the glasses from me, and at the next lull of the snow swept the whole space below us. "'See,' he said, "'they come quickly. They are flogging the horses and galloping as hard as they can.' He paused and went on in a hollow voice. "'They are racing for the sunset. We may be too late. God's will be done.' Down came another blinding rush of driving snow, and the whole landscape was blotted out. It soon passed, however, and once more his glasses were fixed on the plain." Then came a sudden cry. "'Look! Look! Look! See, two horsemen follow fast, coming up from the south. It must be Quincy and John. Take the glass. Look, before the snow blots it all out.' I took it and looked. The two men might be Dr. Seward and Mr. Morris. I knew at all events that neither of them was Jonathan. At the same time, I knew that Jonathan was not far off. Looking around, I saw on the north side of the coming party two other men riding at breakneck speed. One of them I knew was Jonathan, and the other I took, of course, to be Lord Godalming. They, too, were pursuing the party with the cart. When I told the professor, he shouted in glee like a schoolboy, and after looking intently till a snowfall made sight impossible, he laid his Winchester rifle ready for use against the boulder at the opening of our shelter. "'They are all converging,' he said. "'When the time comes, we shall have gypsies on all sides.' I got out my revolver, ready to hand, for whilst we were speaking the howling of wolves came louder and closer. When the snowstorm abated a moment we looked again. 
It was strange to see the snow falling in such heavy flakes close to us, and beyond, the sun shining more and more brightly as it sank down towards the far mountain tops. Sweeping the glass all around us, I could see here and there dots moving singly and in twos and threes and larger numbers. The wolves were gathering for their prey. Every instant seemed an age whilst we waited. The wind came now in fierce bursts, and the snow was driven with fury as it swept upon us in circling eddies. At times we could not see an arm's length before us, but at others, as the hollow sounding wind swept by us, it seemed to clear the air space around us so that we could see afar off. We had of late been so accustomed to watch for sunrise and sunset that we knew with fair accuracy when it would be, and we knew that before long the sun would set. It was hard to believe that by our watches it was less than an hour that we waited in that rocky shelter before the various bodies began to converge close upon us. The wind came now with fiercer and more bitter sweeps, and more steadily from the north. It seemingly had driven the snow-clouds from us, for with only occasional burst the snow fell. We could distinguish clearly the individuals of each party, the pursued and the pursuers. Strangely enough, those pursued did not seem to realize, or at least to care, that they were pursued. They seemed, however, to hasten with redoubled speed as the sun dropped lower and lower on the mountain tops. Closer and closer they drew. The professor and I crouched down behind our rock and held our weapons ready. I could see that he was determined that they should not pass. One and all were quite unaware of our presence. All at once, two voices shouted out, To halt! One was my Jonathan, raised in a high key of passion. The other, Mr. Morris's strong, resolute tone of quiet command. The gypsies may not have known the language, but there was no mistaking the tone, in whatever tongue the words were spoken. Instinctively they reined in, and at the instant Lord Godalming and Jonathan dashed up at one side, and Dr. Seward and Mr. Morris on the other. The leader of the gypsies, a splendid-looking fellow who sat his horse like a centaur, waved them back, and in a fierce voice gave to his companion some word to proceed. They lashed the horses which sprang forward, but the four men raised their Winchester rifles, and in an unmistakable way commanded them to stop. At the same moment, Dr. Van Helsing and I rose behind the rock and pointed our weapons at them. Seeing that they were surrounded, the men tightened their reins and drew up. The leader turned to them and gave a word at which every man of the gypsy party drew what weapon he carried, knife or pistol, and held himself in readiness to attack. Issue was joined in an instant. The leader, with a quick movement of his rein, threw his horse out in front and pointed first to the sun, now close down on the hilltops, and then to the castle, said something which I did not understand. For answer, all four men of our party threw themselves from their horses and dashed towards the cart. I should have felt terrible fear at seeing Jonathan in such danger, but that the ardour of battle must have been upon me as well as the rest of them. I felt no fear, but only a wild surging desire to do something. Seeing the quick movement of our parties, the leader of the gypsies gave a command. His men instantly formed the cart in a sort of undisciplined endeavour, each one shouldering and pushing the other in his eagerness to carry out the order. In the midst of this I could see that Jonathan on one side of the ring of men and Quincy on the other were forcing a way to the cart. It was evident that they were bent on finishing their task before the sun should set. Nothing seemed to stop or even to hinder them. Neither the levelled weapons nor the flashing knives of the gypsies in front nor the howling of the wolves behind appeared to even attract their attention. Jonathan's impetuosity and the manifest singleness of his purpose seemed to overawe those in front of him. Instinctively they cowered aside and let him pass. In an instant he had jumped upon the cart, and with a strength which seemed incredible raised the great box and flung it over the wheel to the ground. In the meantime Mr. Morris had had to use force to pass through his side of the ring of Scani. All the time I had been breathlessly watching Jonathan, I had, with the tail of my eye, seen him pressing desperately forward, and had seen the knives of the gypsies flash as he won a way through them, and they cut at him. He had parried with his great bowie knife, and at first I thought that he too had come through in safety, but as he sprang beside Jonathan, who had by now jumped from the cart, I could see that with his left hand he was clutching at his side, and that the blood was spurting through his fingers. He did not delay notwithstanding this, for as Jonathan, with desperate energy, attacked one end of the chest, attempting to pry off the lid with his great coquetry knife, he attacked the other frantically with his buoy. Under the efforts of both men, the lid began to yield. The nails drew with a screeching sound, and the top of the box was thrown back. By this time the gypsies, seeing themselves covered by the Winchesters and at the mercy of Lord Godalming and of Dr. Seward, had given in and made no further resistance. The sun was almost down on the mountain tops, and the shadows of the whole group fell upon the snow. I saw the Count lying within the box upon the earth, some of which the rude falling from the cart had scattered over him. 
He was deathly pale, just like a waxen image, and the red eyes glared with the horrible, vindictive look which I knew so well. As I looked, the eyes saw the sinking sun, and the look of hate in them turned to triumph. But on the instant came the sweep and flash of Jonathan's great knife. I shrieked as I saw it sheer through the throat, whilst at the same moment Mr. Morris's bowie knife plunged into the heart. It was like a miracle, but for our very eyes, and almost in the drawing of a breath, the whole body crumbled into dust and passed from our sight. I shall be glad as long as I live that even in that moment of final dissolution there was in the face a look of peace such as I never could have imagined might have rested there. The castle of Dracula now stood out against the red sky, and every stone of its broken battlements was articulated against the light of the setting sun. The gypsies, taking us as in some way the cause of the extraordinary disappearance of the dead man, turned without a word and rode away as if for their lives. Those who were unmounted jumped upon the later wagon and shouted to the horsemen not to desert them. The wolves, which had withdrawn to a safe distance, followed in their wake, leaving us alone. Mr. Morris, who had sunk to the ground, leaned on his elbow, holding his hand pressed to his side. The blood still gushed through his fingers. I flew to him, for the holy circle did not now keep me back. So did the two doctors. Jonathan knelt behind him, and the wounded man laid back his head on his shoulder. With a sigh, he took with a feeble effort my hand in that of his own, which was unstained. He must have seen the anguish of my heart in my face, for he smiled at me, and said, "'I am only too happy to have been of service.' "'Oh, God!' he cried suddenly, struggling to a sitting posture and pointing to me. "'It was worth for this to die. Look! Look!' The sun was now right down upon the mountain top, and the red gleams fell upon my face, so that it was bathed in rosy light. With one impulse the men sank on their knees, and a deep and earnest amen broke from all as their eyes followed the pointing of his finger. The dying man spoke. "'Now God be thanked that all has not been in vain.' She, the snow is not more stainless than her forehead. The curse has passed away. And to our bitter grief, with a smile and in silence, he died a gallant gentleman. Note. Seven years ago we all went through the flames, and the happiness of some of us since then is, we think, well worth the pain we endured. It is an added joy to Mina and to me that our boy's birthday is the same day as that on which Quincy Morris died. His mother holds, I know, the secret belief that some of our brave friend's spirit has passed into him. His bundle of names links all our little band of men together, but we call him Quincy. In the summer of this year we made a journey to Transylvania, and went over the old ground which was and is, to us, so full of vivid and terrible memories. It was almost impossible to believe that the things which we had seen with our own eyes and heard with our own ears were living truths. Every trace of all that had been was blotted out. The castle stood as before, reared high above a waste of desolation. When we got home we were talking of the old time, which we could all look back on without despair, for Godalming and Seward are both happily married. I took the papers from the safe where they had been ever since our return so long ago. We were struck with the fact that in all the mass of material of which the record is composed there is hardly one authentic document, nothing but a mass of typewriting except the later notebooks of Mina and Seward and myself and Van Helsing's memorandum. We could hardly ask anyone, even did we wish to, to accept these as proofs of so wild a story. Van Helsing summed it all up as he said with our boy on his knee, "'We want no proofs. We ask none to believe us. This boy will some day know what a brave and gallant woman his mother is. Already he knows her sweetness and loving care. Later on he will understand how some men so loved her that they did dare much for her sake.'" Jonathan Harker the End of Chapter 27 and The End of Dracula by Bram Stoker